Okay, everyone, we're going to start up again. Um, and so we're going to um, have the first keynote presentation for the, the model waiting um, session. So, Max, um, can you share your screen, please? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Yes, I can. Um, okay, we can hear you nice uh, and clearly. Very good. Um, so I can share my screen and you should be able. Um, okay, yeah, we can see your screen. Can you, can you, can you see something? Yeah, we can see it's, it's not full screen yet though. No, 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 not yet. Yeah. Uh, well, fine. Uh, okay, so now you see full screen as well? Yes, we do, that's great. Thank you. So, sorry for being late because now <laughs> I realized it. So with me and Anning, we were working about this until a few hours ago and then we were convinced it was tomorrow morning. And yeah, so thanks to Simon who called me, I was sleeping and uh, I thought it was a spam. I didn't, I was not, almost not picking up, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was Simon. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so this presentation is based on the, on the practical application of waiting in diagnostic, uh, diagnostic, waiting based on diagnostic in ensemble models. I present three case studies, but actually uh, a fourth case study was added uh just uh, three weeks ago and I, another ISIS talks which has been going through the same process in doing benchmark but i will not show them um, just mention in the in the in the last last slides about uh, feedbacks got it from the groups about waiting and ensembles in general so uh, let me just do something um so basically uh it, so current assessment, well, most of the, at least in our area, less in your area, uh, uh, assess, assessments are based on the best case scenario. Uh, and the best case scenario is also sort of waiting because in that context, all models that are being discarded are weighted by, are weighted by zero in, in practice and not using, they have no effects in management. Um, uh, so when, when you use, when well, used ensemble is trying, of course, to quantify or at least to sort of uh, uh, get 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 the total well most of the uncertainty possible uncertainty across all possible models, uh, and uh, because we know about you know about that the best case scenario will not cover uh, what is mainly structural uncertainty, and um, also we know from from other other fields. Uh, especially water forecast, but also uh, forecast in trans transport, uh, is that ensemble ensemble forecasting? It's 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 more um, is is much more um, uh, able to um, to give precise forecast accurate uh, accurate forecast uh, than than single best case scenarios. Um, so, uh, but also we recognize, or has been recognized, in many other fields that um, there is a way, there is a need to weight uh, the models in the in the ensembles because um, you might the, most of the times, well, probably probably all the times, uh, you have the situation where you have several models in your ensemble, but some of them performs differently or performs better or worse than others. And that's basically what happens in in all stock, stock assessment models. In the fishery context, we have, have been have been uh, true. I've been I've been dealing with. Um, so therefore, I mean, and assign the same weight to every model in the ensemble. Uh, it's basically uh, something that we we shouldn't we shouldn't do that because uh, because basically uh, we will we will assign the same the same strength to every single model, even those that are that are, that the which performances are not are not actually uh, not actually very good, and this is actually happens all the time. And so the idea here was that uh, if since we use already model diagnostics to select the best case scenario, or even to select the best case scenario on which we build the ensembles, why not use a model diagnostics also to weight the ensemble, so to weight the models within the ensemble. And that's was the that is the philosophy that pervaded uh, 
these four case studies. Uh, so the three I will show and the fourth I will mention. So the model diagnostics we use to, to select the best case model with, to which we, for, with which we build the ensemble is the model diagnostics based on the papers from, from Philippe, uh, many others, and Lori Kelly, many others. And finally, last year, we have Gorka and many others, uh, generally the usual suspects, uh, which has been working hard in the last, in the last years to try to sort of uh, gathering around all possible diagnostic tools in the two, to, in, to having the toolbox to basically uh, improve the likelihood of uh, having less misspecified models. So models are probably always less misspecified, misspecified somewhere, but try to sort of decrease the likelihood that they are misspecified. And um, you know very well about uh, the paper from Felipe about this, uh, uh, this, mm, this plot of the sort of the concept of detouring, we call it in the paper. Uh, is about basically going through a series of diagnostic in the diagnostic tools, uh, which are the usual suspects again, convergency, goodness of feed, model consistency, like retrospective, et cetera, et cetera. And then to use them in a sort of in uh, the Turing scheme uh, to improve the model and uh, 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 increase the likelihood of, decrease the likelihood of mis misspecification. And uh, so from, from, from another, Another very, another important um, sort of uh, uh, point in the in those papers was that no one no any any single uh, diagnostic should be used in isolation, but diagnostic should be used in uh, in a sort of uh, holistic manner uh, because uh, sort of the concept of having prime models that pass all possible diagnostic are very very rare. And to my experience, I have only two cases. Uh, I know it's Pacific Ake and now. Central Baltic carrying last week. So um, another important concept, and uh, it was taken by the the paper from um, uh, the when discussed uh, uh, a couple of months ago, a few months ago, Mark Maunder um, meeting uh, about how to put these models together. And uh, now um, in our philosophy, we are very interested about uh, risk. So especially risk of falling below BLIM in the ISIS world, in the European, in the European world. And therefore we choose not to mod do model averaging uh, in, like in Dorman paper, but we choose to do something we call model stitching. And the difference is, is in, this, uh, in, this nice, in this nice plots that Henning prepared, they say it's the difference between uh, having two uh, models, but when you average them, you get the gray one on the top, but if you stitch them, you get the gray one on the bottom and you see that the tails are preserved. And for, for people like us that are very interested in risk, uh, preserving the tails is what we want. And therefore we choose to not averaging models, but to stitch models. And I will tell you what we do, how we stitch them. So um, that's the principles, uh, sort of that's philosophy. And uh, then we run into the ensemble and uh, we have been using uh, an automated process based on uh, Stock synthesis and based on the the the, the library from 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 Henning, uh, it's called SS3 Drag Diax, which is somehow is able to autom automatize the process, and uh, um, so now I go through the the three case study and then I mentioned the number four in my brainstorming one at the end of the of the presentation when I have like the slides about the uh, what we learn and what we how the way forward can be can be paved in the, in the future. And uh, the first case is, uh, is the first application of an ensemble modeling in GFCM stock. GFCM is in the Mediterranean, uh, taking care of the Mediterranean stocks. And uh, that was done two years ago now. Uh, it's a sole, so it's a flatfish. Um, and um, for all of these models, we, we, we basically, uh, uh, the philosophy again, another philosophy that we introduce is about sort of uh, uh, having um, the construction of the ensemble uh, as uh, seen as an evolutionary tree uh, from evolving from one sort of uh, ancestral model going through sort of the final model that we use uh, the, to build the, the ensemble around with. And you can see this nice uh, sort of uh, idea of uh, evolutionary tree about uh, the red that sort of the the, the the lineage that uh, that has been ex 
that goes extinct. So the models that we, we don't pursue anymore uh, for different reasons, by diagnostics most of the time, or same results in case of long time series, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, you have uh, uh, the final model to which you around you build your ensemble. Uh, so this is another aspect of our philosophy. So we don't basically do sort of uh, factorial uh, building factorial uh, possible configurations modeling. So basically everything, but we, we follow an hypothesis testing theory and uh, we go through sort of uh, ancestral uh, sort of lineage with pruning uh, along the way. Um, so again, the diagnostic is based on the on the SS3 diags and the cookbook and other, uh, and other papers philosophy. And uh, we have the four uh, um, sort of uh, overarching criteria, uh, which are convergence and stability, of course. Uh, and then we have the goosiness of fit with run test mainly, and the joint residuals, but mainly run test as a test of the residuals. And then we have um, uh, classical retrospective analysis in consistency. And finally, the newly added the toolbox, which is designed the casting cross validation. And uh, we go through uh, all four of them. This is the case of the soul. And we, of course, uh, uh, use another, another important point of this philosophy is using pass fail. Um, and the reason why I use pass fail is because it's much easier to communicate to uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, especially. Uh, that something either pass or fail uh, a test. For example, this is the run test and joint residuals, where we have, uh, you know, from the paper, we have the threshold values for passing and fails. Uh, so as well, we have the threshold values for passing and fails in retrospective analysis, et cetera, and et cetera, as well in MASE. Uh, so we built our, um, our matrix of pass and fails for each of the of the model in the ensemble, so the combination all of them, and this goes goes us to sort of final table with all the models and all the diagnostics for each of the model. And now uh, here is the the differences in these three uh, examples I will present you. So the first time we did this one, we we actually um, basically uh, use every single diagnostic as a one number and then aggregate everything in the final uh, weight score. Uh, and then we use a, a threshold of 70%. So if a, if a model does not pass, at least 70% is excluded by the ensemble. Now, that was not the case here, but that was decided a priori. Uh, and the, the, all decisions were taken a priori about which test to use and which threshold to use, et cetera, et cetera. That is very important. And it was very big buy-in in the stakeholders arena about that all the rules of the games were decided a priori. Nothing was done uh, in course of the, of, the, of the work in the benchmark. So that's, uh, for example, the soul, uh, the classical banana shape plot of the, of the soul model and um, uh, uh, after waiting. So basically uh, the, the idea here is that uh, uh, if you have all the models in your ensemble and then uh, using, um, using um, um, uh, let's call it uh, uh, Henning uh, MLVN um, uh, uh, machinery in the SS3 Diags library. Uh, we can basically uh, resample uh, from the valence covariance matrix. We, we can resample uh, X amount of times each of the model. So we can basically decide that the, uh, and use, using the weights. Each of the models is assigned with a certain number of observations or sort of resample observations for our final ensemble. So for example, if uh, you decide that you have 5,000 uh, uh, sort of uh, MLVN uh, observations, uh, if a model has passed all the tests, they will get all 5,000, for example, just now uh, giving an example. If the model passed only 50% of the test, we will get only uh, 2,500 observation when, when stitched in, in the ensemble. So that's the philosophy here. And that's the machinery, how the machinery works in automatic, automatized way. Now, this is the, the model of the Botnes Hivendes, which is the first national, uh, uh, Swedish national stock that used ensemble uh, and a weighted ensemble in advice. And uh, similar to the, to the Sol, we have 27 models. Uh, in these cases, we have, I think the first application of the M2 stock synthesis model with the 
prediction mortality within the model. In this case, it's seals. And uh, again, same philosophy. Uh, we go through all the tests and prepare the, the table. And the table uh, give us the weights. And then the weights uh, are used in ensemble stitching. Now, in these cases, uh, they were the same philosophy as the sole, but uh, we did not use a threshold because um, we thought that um, uh, that I mean, unless model really fails everything, they should not be penalized just to get into 70%. Also, because it was difficult to agree in the arena why the 70%. So in these cases, we basically use the same philosophy. Every every diagnostic gets uh, gets a score, uh, but uh, there is no threshold. Uh, and that's how the results again uh, in the resembling, uh, as, as I described, the MLVN machinery with the weight and then the stitching. Now, um, we have the third example, the fourth, and the third uh, is the last I will show you. And this is the first application in ISIS. There is uh, this one last week uh, with the central Baltic carrying. This is the Norton prone. This is a, a shrimp. Uh, and here uh, we also uh, build our nice uh, sort of uh, uh, ancestral tree, uh, uh, departing from a very old XSA model in this case, and ending up with the, the new stock synthesis model. And um, in these cases, you can see that um, there is only one dimension. So in the, in the ISIS uh, machinery, uh, we have two example of ensemble, the first two example of ensemble, which only use M of a as a dimension. The other things are, are um, estimated within the model. And this is just the choice we did, but of course uh, the dimension are up to up to the analysts. And in these cases is M and also in the central Baltic area in case is M. Uh, and the reason why we choose M here, it's it's a classical reason why, because this is a, a shrimp and there is a, uh, a lot of uncertainty about the level of M due to the predators um, in the sea and also um, the life history traits. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the machinery went through uh, using SS3 Diags and all were, everything was automatized uh, in these cases as well. And we built our pass and fails. Now you see that this model actually is not the prime model in, in terms of pass and fails. There is no threshold, otherwise this model two would not pass. But uh, the difference here is that we aggregated the score by compartment. Um, um, so uh, that basically, uh, for example, all the run tests, all the tests of the residuals gets a score and all the tests of the retrospectives gets another score, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, we have basically uh, three different uh, way of doing the weighting. One, it's the pure weighting, we call it, without any threshold and any compartmentalization of the diagnostics. Then we have the, uh, the same things, but uh, without the threshold. And then finally, we have the, the compartments. We call it like when you have uh, when you basically assign to each of the sort of your main key diagnostics, like for example, the residuals or retrospective or the MASE, one single weight, aggregated weight. Uh, there's been very different reaction about the differences, uh, at least in our experience. There were no sort of, uh, um, sort of um, silver bullet saying that's one is better than the other. Uh, so I think it's still, so we have in, sort of infancy stage where, um, well, well, with there are different sort of philosophy around the table. Um, but again, we did all three and um, yeah, we are not yet decided which is the, the best, probably the best will be to, to compartmentize the, the, the diagnostics in, otherwise when you have a lot of run tests because you have a lot of uh, fleets, for example, you will end up with a lot of run tests having a la larger weights on the of the weights itself than uh, for example retrospective or end casting so there is some merit about comp making compartments and this is again the model estimates uh, the single model estimates and then sample model estimates after stitching and weighting so now um, uh, what i want to go actually and probably dedicate more time is about sort of uh, what we learned and uh, what we think is the way forward and why we think waiting is important and what we think we should do uh, in the near future to improve the system, which I think is, is good, but of course is, 
is at infancy and needs a lot of uh, a lot of improvements. So we know that the entire process of assessment is provided by weighting. So even if we don't, if you the best case scenario, you assign weight zero to other configuration. So it's you wait all the time. Um, and that's something we should take into in, in mind uh, about ensembles, about modeling in general. Uh, so another important things we ask ourselves, and we think it's really the, the, the right ask, the right question to ask is about, um, uh, would you prefer we always say, would you prefer a model that can predict CPUE trend, for example, or model that is uh, uh, good in retrospective and ion casting, or a model that, for example, it's always estimating a trend or unstable in, 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 uh, in retrospective. Of course, we want a model that is stable in retrospective uh, or have a good prediction, predictive power in ion casting. And therefore, I think uh, if you have an ensemble, uh, you have models that have, have different performance, you cannot treat them equally because what you want is actually not. Uh, doesn't imply to be treated equally. Um, so from a tactical perspective, you also learn that model weights are parameters to be chosen in a way that we want to achieve best coverage of uncertainty. That's that's the target. So there is no real specific interpretation, at least in our world, um, uh, that is attached to the weight. They only have to be do the work. So they only have to give us what we want, which is the model that does uh, uh, that does what we actually think they should do in terms of retrospective, for example, or in terms of ion casting, et cetera. And also another things we learn, uh, I think you learn yourself in your ensembles, if you weigh them or if you try to weigh them or try to see how much they pass in diagnostics is that these prime models like uh, Pacific X does not are very, very rare and um, or like central body carrying and passing all diagnostics, especially if you have a lot of fleets, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, the model is complex. It's very, very rare. It's basically almost mission impossible. Um, so that we don't want to exclude the models because we, they don't pass one or two things, but we want to weigh them so we can have all together as possible, uh, plausible um, uh, realization of, of the truth. So <coughs> uh, the lesson to learn is about that so the, the most important point in ensemble and also in ensemble weighting is the reference case you have around you which you, are, you build your model. That's absolutely the most important part and it's the part that should dedicate more time. Uh, the other most important things we learn from stakeholders mainly, but also from our colleagues around, which have been facing the ensemble for the first time in the assets machinery is that the weighting scheme must be agreed beforehand. And this is to avoid cherry picking and ensure transparency. And that was really appreciated by everyone around the table. I had a very good comment from Anders Nielsen saying that this is really very good that we, uh, he was not tagging other parts, but he was saying that this is really good that we have everything before and agreed so that nobody's working on cherry ping arena, uh, a certain point of the benchmark stage. Uh, pass and fail seems to be preferred than uh, continuous things because it's easy for the stakeholders to understand when things pass or fail. Uh, sometimes, well, at least in our models, the differences were not very big, but uh, the Pandalus was sort of case where the differences were not that small. And then because we're interested in risk, we prefer stitching to averaging, as I, as I explained you in the first slides. And uh, um, uh, we also believe now that basically using this balance weighting scheme where uh, things that are sort of uh, representing the same diagnostic, like uh, residual runs test or end casting, should be aggregated in one score instead of being one single weights in the in the table. This is this will create more balanced weighting scheme uh, than we in the beginning. So uh, so that's the the direction we are going. And um, you have to consider high prioritization weightings maybe in the future because there are fissure independent and fishery dependent information now. In these cases, in ISIS, we only have fishery independent uh, index, so we are lucky, but I know that in the tuna world, that's not the case. And for example, you might be considering to prioritize recent against historical time series, for example, Iran test, because of course, you're more interested in the, uh, in the recent part for the forecast than in the, in the historical part when it comes to fitting. Uh, <clears throat> 
In the four assessment we have been uh, using, and this has been tested and accepted and used for advice, uh, the weighting has been per perceived as very as a key and very important and has been sort of by him, by everyone. <laughs> so no critics has been expressed by the waiting, especially when the waiting was this, the way, the way of waiting was decided beforehand. So no surprises in the middle of the game. Uh, that was really some sort of appreciate, appreciated things. As I say, other people like uh, Anders has critics about the, the fact that we can, we use sometimes in ensemble, well, most of the times, I guess, uh, correlated models. But then again, uh, long discussion. I mean, what if Fergus also use correlated models or highly correlated models? So here we go. It's uh, maybe something we can think about, but correlation may be an area of looking into. Um, and again, we are lucky in access because we have this feature independent service in all case studies we presented here uh, that we use as an anchor for the model. But I guess that that's not the same luck for you guys uh, because having CPUE might, you know, may introduce my have often have conflicting trends and this might actually uh, pose new challenges uh, or challenges along the line. But again, the, the waiting itself was uh, was very well welcomed by uh, by a fora that has never been uh, dealing with ensemble in, uh, in, in, in under 10 years like ISIS or like uh, GFCM. Uh, um, so the waiting was always um, seen as a as a big improvement. Uh, and diagnostic weighting was seen as a big improvement. Uh, for the research, and this is my last slide, I have only five minutes left. Um, so uh, maybe we should turn it, well, maybe, prob prob <laughs> surely we should um, explore uh, alternative validation basic metrics, uh, for example, that are suitable for non threshold model weighting, like, for example, uh, to be consistent with ICO likelihood. And there has been some discussion also in previous fora already about that. One of these approaches that I've been discussing uh, a lot, Denning and others, uh, is about this prediction likelihood approach. So we can compute prediction residuals from end cost cross validation from multiple sources, uh, and then we can use them uh, as, a, as a weighting. Um, uh, this is probably something we really should go for uh, in the future, and me and Enning are working on that. Uh, try to see if we can actually produce a weeding scheme in that way instead with prediction likelihood in the future and compare against uh, our sort of rudimental or more simple uh, pass and fail uh, scheme. So that's something we want to do. And uh, and uh, dealing with the alternative data inputs of variance weeding settings is and remain a challenge uh, for now and also for the future model. So uh, these are the, the sort of long-term future exploration or long-term future work we would like to do uh, in waiting. But we fundamentally believe that waiting is, uh, is important and, uh, and, uh, and after we get this really huge buy-in from the stakeholders and from the, our colleagues around, we, we really think that um, it's, the, it's the right way to go. And uh, some uh, building up some, some web application, the Shani app, for people interested to see uh, uh, how we uh, present it to the stakeholders and to the to the benchmarks, the, um, our ensemble weighting and ensemble ensemble weighting, you can uh, you can refer to these um, shiny apps that we I myself produced together and Francesco produced it, or the three, these three models that I presented today. If you are interested, uh, sort of a way of uh, um, easily. Um, um, see and look into each model, especially if you have like 20 model or 30 model or more, 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 than, more than 30, 40 models, it's very difficult to represent them. And shiny apps are really handy in a way uh, uh, for doing that. They've been appreciated very much by stakeholders, especially. And I have two minutes left and I think I stopped sharing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Max. Um, we got a time for a couple of questions. Anyone has a question for Max? Yeah, Laria. Thanks, Max, for a very comprehensive talk. I was wondering how will be incorporated in such an automatic or objective system or set of criteria the last 
tire that of diagnostic toolbox that Felipe presented. That is the possibility coming from expert knowledge in case that it should be included. So what will be possible diagnostics or performance metrics to be included to select rajet or down weight, uh, not possible models in terms of observer productivity and TC. So any thoughts around how to incorporate plausibility in the system? Thanks. Yeah, well, I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> also with ending, um, we didn't find out in the, at the moment we have no idea. Well, we have found out a way to do it, like you say, in objective way, but uh, we put a lot of effort in the when we build the the we call the reference case when we build the reference case model, we put a lot of effort uh, and to do this plausibility check. So we call it sanity checks uh, in ISIS uh, from Danny Howell, uh, so that uh, the stakeholders as well uh, knowledge is in the game. That I mean they recognize the 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 base case scenario to basically um, uh, at least mirror in being in the ballpark of the dynamics they expect to be. So. We put a lot of effort when we build the mod, the, the reference case model, but we haven't find the, we haven't given a lot of thoughts how to automatize the this kind of information into the machinery. Unfortunately, something we are looking into. Thanks, Max. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Carolina. Thank you, Max, for this great presentation. Uh, I was thinking like um, there will be uh, models that come uh, after the, the reference case. So you, you are growing your tree, right? And you're also pruning your tree. So I guess uh, there's a, a weighting component there on the models you are excluding and including, right? In that uh, you, you have any insights on, on that process and how you grow your tree and uh, what do you use to to propose those hypotheses there? So, yeah, so that's a very good question and I like it because, um, um, so the pruning, as you call it, we call, I call it pruning, we call it pruning as well, uh, is done also by diagnostics. So the, the pruning is done by diagnostics as well. Uh, um, mainly, sometimes it's done by, by, by convenience. For example, if you have a model that starts in 1903 and the model starts in 1970, you have a long time series of catches behind you, but the two models have exactly the same dynamics. I mean, maybe in the one case we prune the, uh, we prune the, 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 long, the long one model because we say, okay, I mean, we get exactly the same dynamics as MB0, et etc. et cetera. We don't need to make our life complicated. We, we take away the, the long time series of catches and just keep the others. For example, I mean, that was a choice, but but the pruning is done exactly in the same machine, automatic, automatized machinery of the, the, of the, um, of the, um, of the weighting. So if a, if a model is basically red in our, in our ancestral tree is because it has not passed, uh, basically has not passed key diagnostic, or for example, retrospective or MAS or many of them. So has been excluded in that way, uh, or sometimes by convenience or sometimes for other reason. But um, mainly we try to use the, the, diagnostic, the diagnostic tool machineries to prune the models along the way. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's what we have been done. Okay, thanks, Max. Well, <laughs> Philippe, you have a question? Yeah, just um, I guess I'm I'm just wondering, sort of playing devil's advocate here, perhaps is you know doesn't that kind of process then sort of contradict the idea of having a you know a, a pre-agreed kind of weighting scheme? Um, you know, if you're essentially already pruning along the way and and using weights in a way that is perhaps not consistent with the weighting scheme that you're applying after the fact and I guess the other aspect of that is, you know, should the should the path towards that reference case be part of that tree as well? I guess at what point do you decide that, you know, you're at the reference case versus, you know, for example, you could you could go further down the tree um, where you've already pruned off a number of those models and say, well, this is actually a reference case and and we're starting from here. So essentially, you know, where where's the start and end point of the of the process and how do you define that? And, well, that's uh, that's a very good question. But um, well, in these cases, we're 
we first of all we we try to be pragmatic in a way also some at the same time because we when we cannot produce like uh, 200 reference case and then multiply by the dimension of the ensembles well you can in theory but uh, we don't want to have ensembles of 5,000 models <laughs> or something like this. But in this, in, in our cases, most of these models were be pruned, the red one, were because they were, you know, they did give completely, like dynamics were out of the blue. They were like, you know, giving 5 million stones or uh, they, they were not feeding the data or, the, I mean, it was like sort of disaster models. So that those ones were pruned in, in the first place. Uh, and then, when there are the, of course, there are always the analyst, the analyst expertise choice to see, do we need to, uh, do we need, what do we want our, our reference case to be? I mean, we cannot have like 15 dev reference cases. Uh, you, I mean, at least, at least we don't want to because it gets really complicated, uh, intricate, and multi dimensional. So, yeah, uh, you're 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 right. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a less of an objective weighting at that point, but um, most of the time the models fails, so it goes away extinct is because they really don't pass key diagnostic or really give very sort of banana results. I mean, just out. But yeah, you're right. It might be the situation where you might have like multiple uh, reference case, multiple possible reference case. And uh, then it's um, then it's a choice. So if you want to have your five thousand ensemble, or you have a lot, want to have like twenty thousand, twenty in models ensemble, and it's up to the analyst, I guess. Yeah, there thanks. is no silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. <laughs> thanks. I I actually totally agree with that. Um, you know, but I just I just thought this. I guess it it is a really tricky question. I think, and you know, and I don't think mm -hmm. there is a, a single. You know, single best answer to that. I think there, there's mm. always that element, and I think you'll you'll see in my talk now that I basically agree. Okay, I think we should move on to the next presentation, but we have a long discussion period um, at the end of this. So, if you have any questions for Max, we can bring it up then. Thanks, Max. So thanks, Mark and uh, Simon, for the invite. Um, I guess for those of you who don't know me, I'm Phil Neubauer. I work for a little outfit here in Wellington called Dragonfly Data Science, and um, we've been working with SPC um, and WCPFC for the last few years, mainly on sharks. So as you, as I tell you, I'm, I'm tuna adjacent. I'm not someone who's done a tuna stock assessment myself. So um, you know, perhaps you can take that to mean that you don't actually have to take any of my um, best practices very seriously. Um, so, and yeah, I just wanted to thank upfront, thank SPC for really lots of really great discussions over the last few years on ideas related to this, um, and also Nicola specifically on discussions over the last few weeks and, and even well before that, um, you know, doing shark assessments. There have been really regular discussions with a number of people, Philip Cavallo as well. Um, so I think that's, that's um, I guess I just wanted to make that acknowledgement here. Um, and I'm going to start off with pretty much the same intro that I gave last time when we had the model weighting workshop um, in November, the IATTC workshop. And um, I, think, I think it's essentially, this is, already been covered, but in theory, you know, all aspects of um, model weighting could be encoded in the model. You could encode, you know, uncertainty about data inputs, um, the data itself, structural uncertainty, estimation uncertainty. In theory, that would be, um, you know, a way of essentially capturing all the uncertainty that we have in a single kind of um, framework. In practice, obviously, that's pretty impractical. Um, we've got 
you know, we've, we've got a lot of different hypotheses often and putting them all together in a single model and letting the model choose in between those is, is um, almost impossible or probably it is impossible. So there is some kind of practical aspect to model weighting um, and, you know, that practical aspect I think sits somewhere on a continuum between the sort of winner takes all base case approach, which I think is still quite prevalent in a lot of places and including in some tuna stock assessments. Um, all the way to, for example, having an unweighted ensemble across a whole lot of different models um, and all of those things um, are out there in the wild. And so I guess my thought was that for this workshop, I try to synthesize that a little bit and try and understand sort of what the common topology is and whether we can come up with a best practice for some of the aspects in model weighting. So as, as we've already just heard, you know, model weighting really pervades every aspect of um, stock assessment practice. So if we're thinking about a base case model, for example, you know, in my limited ex experience, usually there's two forms of weighting that go into it. One of those is expert opinion on the likelihood of inputs. So you choose essentially which data sources you put into your model. And then you go through the process that, um, you know, where usually there's, there's Boolean weighting pruning of that tree of plausible models. And you end up with, for example, a single base case model at the other end. And I think often, you know, and, and I think that's one of the, one of the aspects that we should think about is often that's done in a somewhat informal way. And I think as a result, it's often somewhat poorly documented compared to the process that, you know, that the models that you end up with and the sensitivities that you end up with. So, and, and usually that relative weight of diagnostics is, you know, it's a pass fail, but that pass fail is based on expert judgment. Someone makes the call of whether some, whether it's good enough or not. And so I guess the result is this sort of decision tree, but it's a Boolean decision tree. You end up with a single answer out the other end and often depending on how your model is structured that answer can obviously gloss over a lot of uncertainties that we considered along the way um, so a more nuanced and i would argue reproducible approach is that you could attach weights to weights to each of those steps and make that explicit now i guess as you've seen from that discussion that we just had is is really not obvious where to start and end with that process um, but i think that it's the reproducible aspect i think that makes it compelling is that you can encode expert opinions and model adequacy in weights. And, you know, even if, if those weights are zero, sometimes I think if, as long as you encode that in the process, I think that's a useful thing to know for analysts going down the line in the future. And I think unless the weight is zero, you could argue, you know, sometimes maybe we shouldn't attach a zero weight to all of those models that don't look particularly great for whatever reason. And we should really stay with an ensemble approach. And I guess, as I was thinking about it, you know, and looking back at the workshop that we had, um, it wasn't actually clear to me how you define an ensemble a priori. So, so after a bit of thinking about it, um, I think hopefully um, I, I will give some idea of, of, a, of a way to think about ensembles here that, that is a little bit more general and, and provides a, I guess, a, a bit of a framework for how to think about it. So in that 2022 IATTC Kaplan workshop on model ensembles and weighting, I think to me, one of the, one of the standout kind of thing, um, things that came out of it was that there's really a broad range of the way that people derive ensembles and, and also then weight those ensembles and how they interact with those ensembles. Um, you know, there's, there's grid approaches, large factorial grids sometimes over, over uncertainties, Monte Carlo approaches to address parameter uncertainty. Um, there's sometimes predetermined weighting schemes, but also sometimes um, sort of these um, post hoc or, or expert judgment weighting um, going on. There's pass fail versus, you know, attaching direct weights to a range of statistics. Um, that those statistics have some overlap, but are not necessarily the same between models and ensembles. And then there were small ensembles that were presented. Um, you've just seen, seen a number of those now, where it's usually sort of a, a number of key model, models with structural uncertainties versus, I guess, really large ensembles of hundreds or sometimes thousands of models. 
that capture many uncertainties, often parameter uncertainties. Um, so there's ensembles that focus on estimation uncertainties versus those that focus on structure, structural between model uncertainties. And I guess what, what came out of that workshop for me was that there's not really a good best practice that's currently identified on how to you know, even present those models and, and ensembles and then um, how, to take, how to take them through a process that, um, that you know, might bring some consistency for, you know, for managers to look at as well. Um, you know, even within a single RFMO, often there's different approaches to this. And so sort of my experience in the WCPO is that, you know, there's, there's really a range of ways that assessments are done and synthesized, um, you know, from, the, from these ensembles. So I guess I wanted to thank Mark for sending out the, the sort of current practices sheet because it saved me a lot of time looking through um, RFMO assessments and understanding what the current practice is. Um, and I guess I was surprised at how prevalent the ensembles already are in all RFMOs, um, in, or at least in, in most of them. And I guess they sort of deal with the main uncertainties that you would think they, they ought to deal with, um, you know, natural mortality, um, steepness, often growth, but perhaps a bit less often. Um, I guess some, some models, and, and um, I didn't really look at the details, but um, looks like IOTC models also look at alternative spatial structures, so deal with the structural uncertainty a little bit more. Um, I guess my experience from the WCPO is that uncertainty grid approaches have been really prevalent there. And um, I guess we've been looking more recently into approaches to develop um, diagnostics and, and for weighting ensembles in the context of swordfish for Nicola, in the context of sharks for myself. Um, in the WCPFC um, to look at essentially how we can diagnose models and and weight models in ensembles. And I guess a lot of that in, in our case, we, you know, for example, for the sharks, those were those were models where we didn't really have a good idea how the, how they would respond in the first place. So we re really looked at sort of post hoc interpretation of the, the trends and post hoc weighting. Now you can argue that you know, perhaps you should focus on, or you, you should have all of that predetermined, but I think I would argue that for some models, especially if you've never done one, it's really hard to determine or to know which diagnostics are actually going to be informative. So I guess for the moment, we've, we've focused on, on more of a post hoc exploration of the model space. Um, I guess Mark's ITTC risk analysis and the update really focuses on a more complete and structured sort of end-to-end -end recipe for model development and model weighting. Um, and, and this a priori determination of the process and the weights. And I think, I think there's sort of a, a, a nice dichotomy here to think about. And I think um, what, we just, what we just heard from Europe is that sort of set somewhere in between where there was still some post-hoc interpretation of a number of models before you get to this predetermined kind of weighting stage. So it's, I guess that was somewhere in between the two approaches that, um, that we've taken here in the, in the, in the Pacific Ocean, at least. Um, so I guess, as I was thinking about this talk, is I was trying to ask myself, you know, how to come up with ideas for best practice here and, and, you know, and things that are perhaps common to all assessments, perhaps not just tuna assessments. And, and I guess based on that, we, we might suggest strategies that, you know, that, that can help, if not necessarily dictate what those ensembles look like, but how to present those and how to, how to think about them. And so as I was doing that, um, I guess being, being slightly attached to Bayesian analysis and, and Bayesian thinking, um, I kind of, I, I tried to think about how I would think about it from a very idealized point of view. Um, I guess if, if I went back to that idealized um, process of having everything in a single model, what would that look like? And you know, how does that actually work? And so if you look at, if you look at Bayesian statistics and um, you know, averaging over models in Bayesian statistics, I think it actually, if, if you look at it in some detail, it provides a really useful framework for how to think about um, ensembles, the construction of ensembles, the evaluation, and, and the putting back together of ensembles. And, um, and so I've got a few equations in here, um, and I thought this is a modeling workshop. Um, everyone should be able to handle some equations. Um, so 
I guess this is the sort of fairly standard equation for Bayesian model averaging. Um, we're interested in some quantity y here um, that is, for example, a management quantity, stock status, um, um, something that we're interested in that is not, you know, a direct, directly observable quantity. And we've got a set of models M here that we're trying to uh, trying to derive predictions from for that quantity. Um, I guess in the first instance, what we want to do is essentially integrate over those models to derive that prediction. Um, so when you do that in the Bayesian framework, you've got your predictive distribution, which is the P of Y given M and X. And then you've essentially, you've got to weight that by the, by the posterior distribution of the model itself, given the data that you have. So you can decompose that into the structure of the models, which is the, the S here. So that these are the plausible models that have support in your, in your prior of a model space. Um, and, and your theta, which is your parameters given your model. So you can, you can decompose, we've still got this predictive distribution here, but now we've got the posterior distribution of structures, of model structures, and of the parameters within those model structures given the data. And we actually wanna integrate over the, over the structural uncertainty, but this de decomposition also shows that we're also integrating over parameter uncertainty within each of those models. So you've got this, these two integrals essentially that say we, you know, we should really be integrating over a space of models and we should be integrating within those models, we should be integrating over the uncertainty within each of those models. So it gives us, um, I guess, one way to think about it. And for example, one thing that when I started thinking about it that way that's, that struck me was that a lot of what we think about ensembles um, often they evaluate this inner integral here. Um, you know, they, they are ensembles of M, for example, ensembles of a steepness. So they're really ensembles of a parameter uncertainty. They're not necessarily ensembles of a structural uncertainty. So it's the same parameter H, it's the same parameter M that, you, that we're evaluating uncertainty over. But, um, you know, sometimes we, we have one or, or no, you know, or, or essentially few, very few models in that outer integral where we're, that represents structural uncertainty. Um, I guess, I guess if, we, if we push that a little bit further, um, we can decompose that, um, that equation a little bit, a little bit further into, into individual components. So this posterior for the structure and the model parameters given the data, we can decompose that further into the posterior for the parameters given the structure and the data and the posterior of the structure itself given the data. And this is, this is uh, a tricky beast here, obviously. And it's the reason why we usually can't do this, actually do this in practice. But I'd argue that it's still a use, useful thing to think about it this way, um, because you can then decompose this even further into, into essentially the posterior for, for the structure. Um, you, could, you can essentially decompose this into a prior over the structures your posterior, oh, sorry, your prior of the parameters given the structure, and then your likelihood assessment. And if you write this in a hierarchical form, so this is essentially a hierarchical model if you think about it in, in that way. Um, you've got this, this tree approach and this hierarchical approach, which we've already seen um, just now for, um, for some of these European stocks, where essentially your starting point is a prior over plausible structures. So it's, it's this idea of, you know, trying to come up with plausible hypotheses, plausible structural hypotheses from your data and, and from what you know about the biology. So that's the first step and it really maps onto the, onto the sort of Bayesian decomposition here. Once you've got that, you then think about the, the parameters in the context of those structures. Um, I guess what that means is that, you know, for a given structure, you know, for example, a prior for M may not actually mean the same thing. Um, so I think that's, that's a useful step. And then you've got this third stage, which is essentially plausibility assessment. So this is, you know, once, you, once you've got your set of models, you've got, your, you've, you've got your parameter space within those models, you've got a third stage, which is the plausibility assessment um, of, the, of that combination of parameters and structures. And then once you've done that plausibility assessment, then you can combine the predictions of those, um, of those models. And so 
um, I think it's quite easy to see that you know some of the some of the current practice already maps onto that quite well. But I think it also gives gives us a, a way of um, thinking about it that essentially decomposes the process into structural uncertainty, process uncertainty, and and gives us a way to think about ensembles rather than sort of chucking everything into it is, you know, that it, it's actually a decomposition of that of that uncertainty into different aspects of that uncertainty. And I think um, we've seen that. I think the the EPO um, risk assessment, for example, for um, for Big Eye, I think it was, I think does a really good job of of you know of really doing that decomposition and and showing where the uncertainties come in. And well. Sorry, I'm getting, getting messed up here. But um, I guess I tried to map this, you know, just draw a really silly graph here of how that might pan out in practice, just to kind of just to kind of see how well current some of the current practice maps onto that. So we've got some structural model sometimes, you know, if we've already got an assessment model that may be the model that we had last year. So that's why I've got these like, you know, set of structures from last time. But we probably want to evaluate that given, you know, given new data, given what we know now, and come up with a new set of structures. They may be close, they may be not close. And I think Carolina gave an excellent example of an instance where you, know, you maybe don't want them to be close. Um, at that point, you've got your parameter hypotheses given these models, and then you've got the plausibility assessment, which is this essentially the waiting step. And I think that's kind of where, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road. And that's the difficult part. And I didn't really know how to represent that down here because one of the difficult bits, um, you know, overall in a practical sense is how do you, how do you approach that if this idealized approach really isn't workable, right? I think everything else is kind of workable. So the analogy really only goes so far in that the ideal, you know, the ideal system, really, we can't work with it. And we can't integrate over model space. Usually, we have too little time to really explore a huge number of hypotheses. Right, the building structurally different models is difficult. It requires a lot of time, especially once you have spatial models, processing all the data inputs, etc. It's um, it's a difficult task. So I think um, you know often the outer integral bec becomes a sum, you know, over very few models that you attach non-zero probability to and everything else essentially has zero probability, at least for the time being. Um, I guess different models often have different data inputs. So as we've already heard a number of times, you can't really just compare likelihoods for those models if they have very different data inputs. Obviously, they're not comparable in terms of their likelihood. And so again, the whole, the whole process doesn't really work all that well. And I guess as a result, perhaps, that inner integral over parameter uncertainty, I think, is the one that gets evaluated a lot more readily because it's just that much easier. Um, you know, it's much easier to test your model. We know most models are very sensitive to choices or uncertainties in M. And so at that point, well, sure, you, that's what you put in. We don't really understand how, uh, how sensitive these our models are to structural uncertainties often because we just don't have the resources to look into that in detail. Um, so I guess perhaps there's been an over or there is an overemphasis on parameter uncertainty over structural uncertainty in a lot of the assessments that that happen. Um, but I think I guess nevertheless that Bayesian approach provides a guide to setting up model ensembles and and on mapping current practice and I guess desired practice in a sense that you can then also communicate uncertainties that you left behind. I think. I think um, some of the European examples were very good in that you've got, you know, you, you can essentially show which models you didn't take into account. And if you can document that process, I think that's a really good practice, um, you know, rather than essentially arriving at a set of models and starting from there without, without providing that sort of, you know, clear, um, clear um, pathway. I think the other I think the uh, the first sort of useful distinction that for me that came from that is really to make a distinction between structural and parameter uncertainties in ensembles and to say you know these are the, these are perhaps two ensembles really and the uncertainty or or the, the parameter ensemble should be viewed differently from the from the model ensemble so I just wanted to briefly go through each other the stages and perhaps provide a little bit more background to that um, and, and map some of the current practices on that. So 
structural hypotheses can obviously be very wide. There can be different modeling, um, different modeling paradigms. So for example, surplus production or low information stocks versus age-based or age-length based models even. And if, I really like Carolina's comment on, you know, perhaps it's really useful to do all of those and to do cross comparisons to understand how our models perform. So it's something that we tried for um, Oceanic White Tip in the WCPO, where um, Laura did a stock assessment on using SS3 for the species, but then you know, with, with sharks, we often have large doubts about a lot of the data that goes into these models. And so we wanted to see what alternative approaches might give us. So we also looked at um, dynamic surplus production models and spatial risk assessment models. And we looked at, for example, the fishing mortality relative to um, reference points that came out of these different approaches. And we found that by and large, they were actually giving us um, comparable answers in that if we made assumptions here in the red that um, post-release mortality was still very high, then there was still a higher risk in all of those model approaches that we that that, um, that we were get that we would you know that we were still overfishing. And so, in a sense, we were we were looking at structural uncertainty, and you can see within those models we were we we also had parameter uncertainty, which gave us the the bounds within those models. But if you map it onto this sort of topology, onto this um, Bit of a hacked tree here, then you can see that the, the box that I drew around it in terms of current practice, um, I kind of le left out this. Can't really use the mouse, it seems, but um, I consciously left out this sort of last set of parameters here because I guess what I realized in putting this talk together is that when we looked at the comparison with SS3, for example, we only looked at the reference case. We didn't, we didn't take into account the uncertainty grid. And so when we did this comparison, that's why the SS3 one looks a lot better because we were actually, we didn't take into account the full uncertainty of that model in, in comparing these models. And so ultimately, you know, the management advice, um, I think was mostly structured around the SS3 model, but, but we had different structurally different models that gave us some confidence that we were seeing consistent patterns here um, in terms of fishing mortality. Um, obviously, that that kind of approach can be extended to different structurally different models. I think Carolina's, um, you know, Carolina's idea of having spatial versus non-spatial models to diagnose and compare, you know, understand what your spatial models are doing is a really good one. Um, it also extends to perhaps having potentially conflicting data sets or alternative biological model choices. For example, time varying parameters. Um, you could, I guess, a lot of those you can argue whether they're actually parameter uncertainties or structural uncertainties, for example, time varying um, parameters, you could argue that if your standard deviation is zero, then, you know, so, so you know, it's a question of whether your, your parameter is zero or not. Is it a parameter uncertainty? Is it a structural uncertainty? Again, I think the, the sort of Bayesian decomposition is a little bit vague here, but, um, but I think it's still a useful approach. I guess I was trying to think whether there's a very, you know, whether there's already approaches on how to come up with structural ensembles. And I guess the one, the one that I could think of was the Rose approach. Um, I guess I, I haven't actually employed it myself, but I really like the idea behind it that um, if, you, if you know you've got potential bias or, or you know, real bias in your, in your assessment, essentially trying to employ different avenues of resolving that bias, especially if your data isn't informative on which one of those is true, um, is is probably a much less risky approach than picking one, resolving all the conflicts with a single set of hypotheses, and then assuming that that's useful for management advice. Um, so yeah, I tried, to, I tried to come up with a few more recommendations or best practice ideas. Um, they're obviously up for a discussion, but um, I guess not a, a priori, not all model structures may be deemed equally likely. Um, but I think globally, non-inclusion is a pretty strong prior. So I think your model really needs to be out there, you know, and, and um, to, to not be part of the plausible model space. So I think, I think practically, obviously, a lot of model space will have probability zero because we just can't explore that many models. Um, but we should be honest about that and, you know, and say there were alternative hypotheses that we probably should be exploring. 
but I haven't had time for, and therefore our uncertainty probably underestimates the true uncertainty as well. Um, and I think having a principled sort of hypothesis tree driven approach, I guess, you know, the one that's been advocated already a couple of times, I think is, is a really useful way to think about it, and especially a useful way to, to um, communicate it as well. Um, I think that's one of the key, one of the key difficulties, I think, often when you have a large ensemble is, is communicating that to managers and, and communicating that overall to, to your audience. I think that sort of tree-based approach is a really useful way of collapsing things onto the structure that, um, that's interpretable. Um, I think another good practice here is probably to revisit structural uncertainties in your ensemble models. Um, you know, just because you had a set of uncertainties and structures last time doesn't mean that you necessarily have to go with the same ones this time. I think, again, I, I was, you know, I think that Carolina's on some, uh, Carolina's presentation gave a really good example of when you probably want to switch your structural assumptions to something, um, you know, when, when you, you know, in, at the next iteration. Um, and, and uh, I guess the other, the other, for me, best practice would be to really come up with a principled approach to deriving alternative model structures. So perhaps using the, the Rose approach, alternative movement and stock structures that, um, you know, that you can't essentially distinguish on the basis of data. And so, you know, coming up with a number of those and understanding whether they really have different implications um, for your model. And as, as we've just heard, sometimes they give the same answer and you could say, well, you know, do I need to really need to retain all of those? But I think having that as part of your ensemble modeling process is useful because you can, you can then map it onto this tree and say, well, you know, this was discarded because it gave the same answer. Um, whereas if, you, if you've done that essentially outside of your ensemble, outside of the process, then it's not always clear why the model that you've chosen with X number of spatial strata or X number of fleets is the one that ought to be taken for management advice. Um, parameter uncertainties, I think, parameter hypotheses, I think this is one that I guess, I guess where I think this, this framework makes, makes some sense in that, you know, that there's different ways of evaluating management or evaluating parameter uncertainties. And I think a lot of what we think of as large model ensembles are really essentially approaches to integrating over uncertainty over parameter uncertainty in that sort of, you know, in that inner integral of that Bayesian decomposition, basically. And so you can do that using full MCMC, obviously. And, you know, for me, that's really still the gold standard. And, and you can see like sort of my, my perhaps somewhat um, controversial, um, you know, best practices try first to estimate parameters, use the full MCMC or, you know, your full your full likelihood and covariance matrix to characterize uncertainty in those parameters before going to the Monte Carlo bootstrap or factorial grid approaches, because essentially they're doing the same thing. They're trying to, they're trying to evaluate that integral, but they're doing it in a, you know, in a much more ad hoc way in a, in a grid based way, which is, you know, which is never as good, I would argue. And so, and so I guess there's a few, you know, structural things to think about here, which is that in a grid approach, um, when you do apply that, you know, you really want to, if you really want to go back to the sort of ideal situation, you do need to then apply those prior weights for the parameters that you're applying the grid over. You don't really need to do that if you're applying the Monte, uh, Monte Carlo bootstrap approach, for example, because the, the draws themselves are weighted by the prior probability. But I think there are sort of best practices to derive here that, um, you know, with respect to which approach you actually apply. Um, but overall, I think it's useful to think about this decomposition and say, you know, here's, here's our structural ensemble, and then here's how we evaluate parameter uncertainty within that structural ensemble. And, you know, having, you know, having a large number of models, for example, drawn from Monte Carlo bootstrap may actually be desirable. So you may, you know, it's, a, having a few hundred models there drawn from that distribution is probably a desirable property. Um, I guess the weighting of models is a tricky one. And I think that's where it's really, I think from my point of view, it's difficult to define what best practice is. 
I think the problem here is that usually our likelihoods don't actually have information about the parameters, especially in the, you know, if, if we've decided to use a grid approach, for example, or use alternative structures, it's because we don't have very good information to tell us which one of those is a better model. And, you know, if we could look at that just in the context of a likelihood, for example, we probably would. So often we don't actually have the information. And so understanding which alternative diagnostics need to be employed to weight models in an ensemble approach is really difficult, I think. And so I think at the moment, if I think about best practices there, I think the approach that's used or that was proposed for the, um, for the big eye risk assessment in the Eastern Pacific Ocean, I think is probably the gold standard in that, um, you know, you, you've, you've, you're really following that whole tree down and using a range of weights, a range of diagnostics um, to come up with model weights there. I would argue that it's still not well understood. And I think the, the diagnostics discussion that we just had kind of uh, agreed with that, which diagnostics to use. I think it's still a somewhat arbitrary choice, but at least you know, by, by discussing or by using a range of those, we're hedging our bets a little bit. And so I think at the moment, that's probably best practice until we understand, you know, which of those diagnostics really weights the properties that we're interested in. Um, and so um, here's, a, here's another one in the WCPO, a recent assessment for Blue Shark, where we're also looking at structural uncertainties and parameter uncertainties. So we've got different uncertainties about growth functions, um, initial F, et cetera. But essentially, we didn't really do this decomposition into the structural uncertainties initially and then the parameter uncertainties. And so it's probably something that we can learn from the Eastern Pacific Ocean and from, you know, and, and from this sort of global structure is how to structure our, our setup of the ensembles there. And because I'm gonna run out of time, um, I'm just going to go quickly over the last couple of slides. Um, I guess combining model predictions, I think we've just seen um, we should really be integrating over the models and the uncertainty, and so we should keep the tails. I think that's the important bit. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, I guess um, Europeans call it stitching. I think there's other approaches that call it stacking in a Bayesian context. Um, I, think, I think that ought, you know, that ought to be looked at more. And, you know, the properties, I think for me, the, the key question is how that interacts with management advice. And so I think we really need to look at, um, you know, look more in detail how our choice of diagnostics, how our choice of averaging interacts with the management advice that comes out the other end and how that's presented. So um, I think, I guess the other thing that I wanted to mention, which basically agrees with the, um, with the previous, um, previous discussion is that even though, you know, we can set all of this up a priori, often we don't really know which diagnostics um, are going to come out. And I think, and you know, we've also seen in a number of papers now that some or a lot of diagnostics actually have poor sensitivity to model myth classification, for example. And you know, if likelihoods are uninformative, perhaps we shouldn't expect all of these diagnostics based on the same data to be more informative um, about model myth classification. But I think for me, that kind of means that we need this kind of um, you know, pruning stage or um, expert opinion stage, or you, you might call it a BS detector, you know, looking at the ensemble of models that comes out and trying to understand what, they, what they're actually, how they're actually coming out and then saying, you know, are these models plausible a priori? And then we can apply a pre-agreed weighting grid, for example, but um, arguably that grid probably shouldn't include models that are way out. And um, I found a recent paper, 2019, from a model ensemble over um, Atlantic Todd, for example, where they use different weights, uh, different weighting schemes using um, cross validation, um, retrospectives, AIC, unweighted ensembles, and they found that all of those weighting schemes retained models that they deemed utterly implausible. And so I guess they also concurred that there was no um, hard and fast way to, to get to a reasonable ensemble with diagnostics alone. Um, so as I mentioned, I think right now the sort of EPO big eye risk assessment for me is kind of the, the gold standard of, of the approach, taking that sort of tree-based approach um, to both presenting and setting up your ensembles, I think is really good. Um, and I think the key difficulties are really 
finding justification for the weights that we use um, post ensemble. And I think there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of research questions um, that are still open there on which diagnostics to use when. And I think I'll, I'll probably just leave it there. Um, I think, yeah, we're, we're, we're I think, still away a from being able to theoretically justify the weights that we use. And, you know, ultimately, there's a practical dimension to all of the things that we do. And so uh, I guess I, I, I concur with, uh, you know, with the European group that, you know, sometimes you, you essentially just have to make these choices and then and then you know it becomes an iterative process. So I think I think all of the waiting, all of those choices, shouldn't be locked in for you know for posterity. It's something that you do as you know it's it's a decision that's made by committee. Essentially, we don't have a theoretical justification now, um, and so it's something that we need to develop over time. Essentially, it's a research area, but there are you know those practical I guess. Those practical implications mean that we often have to make choices now. So you know we're somewhere, we're somewhere along the way, but I think we're still we're still a, a, a ways away from you know having a, a strong best practice in how or what we use to weight models specifically. So I'll just I'll just stop there and. Um... Thanks, Phil. Um, we're running a bit over time now, so I think we'll go on to the next presentation. But we've again, we've got a lot of time at the discussion session for questions. So, Nicola. So Nicola's going to give the comment, um, I think mainly to Phil's presentation, but probably more just in general about model weighting. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you to, to Phil and Max for really setting the stage. Um, they covered it pretty comprehensively, so hopefully I can add something constructive to the rest of this discussion. Um, my talk is kind of structured into two parts. Uh, the first part will have some more philosophical considerations that I've been thinking of. And then the second half will kind of deal with the more practical considerations of, of how we actually do this. And the reason I have kind of ensembles and parentheses rather than just model weighting is because as we've seen, there's, there's actually more than just the weighting that goes into this process. Um, so we'll step through that a little bit. So first off, what are we actually looking for out of our ensembles? And I think depending on, on who you are, that, that is a little bit different of, of an objective. So as a scientist, perhaps the ideal model ensemble is one that accurately and objectively characterizes stock status and the uncertainty in stock status. If you're a manager, perhaps the ideal model ensemble is one that provides the information needed to make policy decisions that allow objectives to be met. And if you're a stakeholder, the ideal model ensemble is one that you can understand, one that was developed uh, perhaps with consultation for things that you find important to take into account, and also not done in an arbitrary way. And there's a lot of overlap between these different objectives, but it's possible that they take you in some different directions. Um, and so this can lead to perhaps a trade off between the level of uncertainty that's characterized and the overall management utility, this idea of, of risk paralysis. Um, so we can discuss you know, how these different things should be considered, but stock assessments not taking place in a vacuum. There are some other things going on out there. Another thing that I've been wondering more recently is, is how do we actually assess performance of our ensembles? Is it more important that the ensemble contain the truth or is it more important that the ensemble be used to base management decisions that meet objectives? And again, these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but they also don't have to be the same thing. Um, and so thinking about how to answer this, the second one, you can probably only do in closed loop simulation, um, which kind of brings to the next topic. This is, well, anyways, um, of 
how ensembles might work in uh, management strategy evaluation. So typically we think of these as being part of either the operating model grid or the monitoring strategy of uh, what's covered up there is, is should they be also a part of the uh, estimation um, modeling phase. And this is, came up in discussion uh, with Phil in the last couple of days. Uh, he brought up this paper, which actually looked at um, in a closed loop simulation, some implications, the asymmetric risk of getting your estimation model wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean the same thing in the short term as the long term. Um, and I think at least in the management strategy evaluations that I'm familiar with, um, you're only using a single estimation model rather than a suite of estimation models. Um, so that risk uh, could exist there. Um, so moving into some practical considerations, uh, thinking about the statistical paradigm, I think from Phil's uh, presentation and even some of the earlier discussions we've had this week, um, if you can do Bayesian, it's probably best practice to do it, um, where you're estimating parameters with priors and then you're doing an ensemble across those structural and data uncertainties, where I think we're probably getting close to the point where that is feasible in some cases, especially with these newer uh, packages, 80 nuts, uh, TMB stan. Um, but if if not, you know, the rest of this talk um, will focus on on other other strategies that can be employed. Uh, the other thing that that we need to think about is is how you construct an ensemble. And I think Phil did a really good overview of of highlighting some of these different different approaches. And it's it's kind of really a trade off on from the fewest number of models and just in discussions in the break uh, with Carolina, this is kind of like the jeweler's approach, the, the more uh, precision tuned where you're taking the time to, to really develop and play with the different models um, and build out that hypothesis tree. And then perhaps, you know, more of a, a shotgun type approach um, to try to capture uncertainty. In theory, each of these different formulations can characterize the same uncertainty, but I guess the latter two, they place a lot more emphasis on these pokes talk approaches to either weighting or, or pruning models. Um, and also, I think as we're thinking about best practices, um, I think I, I, I agree with what Phil suggested that this kind of hierarchical hypothesis tree approach is probably a good way of thinking about things. And then within that hierarchy, you can actually nest some of these other structures inside of it if you really have a lot of uncertainty that you're trying to capture. What to include in terms of models? Um, again, conceptual models have come up quite a few times this week, and I think they prove a really useful starting point for identifying the different structural data and parameter uncertainties and key alternative hypotheses. Um, so that could should be considered a best practice for kind of setting the stage for what actually goes into the ensemble. I think self tests can also be really useful. You set you simulate data from your estimation model and you know see how well you're actually able to to estimate the things that you think you should be able to estimate. If you can't, you know, perhaps tweak your model configuration. But that could also be an indication of things that that perhaps should be fixed and then included. Um, as a component of the ensemble. And also, again, this has been a common theme this week is that this is often an, an iterative process. It's, it's not necessarily linear. In development, you might identify structural assumptions that are, are highly influential, uh, as perhaps as a part of a sensitivity analysis and integrating over this uncertainty by including it in the ensemble is, is probably good practice as well. Uh, so actually getting into the theme of of this section, uh, waiting, if you kind of go back to the top and, and think of what the holy grail would be, um, probably want something objective, uh, easy to automate, portable across different data likelihoods. Um, and I think this last one is, is important, but we haven't given too much thought to it, is that it actually gives weight to the models that result in the correct management advice. Um, in practice, again, I, I don't think you can really get at this without much more uh, closed loop simulation. Um, particularly if we're thinking about using diagnostics uh, for waiting, um, as we've seen in, in some of the presentation and, and it's come up in the discussions, uh, some of these diagnostics might 
not have the power to um, discriminate between correctly specified or not have as much power to correct uh, to discriminate between correctly specified and misspecified models. Um, so I think we need to do more research there to identify uh, robust quantitative thresholds that actually allow us to weight models um, that meet our objectives. Um, and again, kind of following along this, this idea, because people are using diagnostics um, to weight models, um, I would suggest that because some of these diagnostics might not have the power that we think they do, they should um, perhaps not be treated in a, in a binary way um, unless clear thresholds have been identified and, and perhaps should be used as evidence to downweight a particular model rather than exclude it completely. Um, and also is something that, that came up in discussion uh, earlier is this idea of, of hind casting. It's got a lot of appeal because that is something that in theory is portable across different likelihoods and different data types. Um, and something that's come up a number of times is, is the importance of making sure that if you're going to use it um, to predict data, that it, it aligns uh, more closely with the management reference point. And again, this is something that, that could be tested with closed loop simulation. It's come up a few times that, that we need a protocol and a framework um, for any post hoc weighting and filtering. And I think that's really important that that framework does get agreed to up front. I think the example from Max that you don't want any cherry picking of results, I think, you know, I think is, is a really good reason why you want this framework in place. Um, a part of that framework, though, I think you have to build in uh, some flexibility to be able to deal with situations that arise. Um, as Phil mentioned, if you've never done an assessment on a particular species before, you might not know how everything is going to work out a priori. Um, additionally, running an assessment, running an ensemble could be an iterative process. I think in this aspect, we can borrow something from uh, Bayesian uh, modeling, this idea of prior push forward checks. I would highly recommend people uh, check out the think tank that Cole Monahan did a couple months ago. He did, gives a good overview of, of prior push forward checks and their utility in a Bayesian context. But I think we can, we can borrow that idea, um, particularly for the uh, money color bootstrap distributions to, to help refine um, that input parameter distributions and, and possible parameter correlations um, to get us in a, a more sensible place uh, to start with. Uh, lastly, this has already been in touch by the previous presentation, but we really want to be combining across models. We don't want to be averaging. We want to be preserving those tails. Um, we also want to be making sure that we include the estimation uncertainty of each individual model. All models should be producing a mean and a covariance matrix. And if you have those two things, then you can use the delta multivariate log normal approach that Max talked about and generate samples from that to combine across, uh, combine that estimation uncertainty across models. How much this actually matters is gonna be kind of a case by case basis, depending on kind of the estimation uncertainty associated with each individual model. and kind of where it sits in that overall distribution of different model hypotheses, um, but probably something that we should be doing as a regular practice. And so I've, I've highlighted a lot of, of different topics that are um, kind of open questions, um, but these are some that I have that are a little fully, more fully formed, um, particularly for this Monte Carlo bootstrap ensemble that's really similar to uh, a Bayesian model is is actually running those two side by side with the same input priors one using the monte carlo bootstrap um, to approximate over those parameter distribute parameter uncertainties the other in a full bayesian sense and actually look at what you're losing by not doing it in a full bayesian um, context um, something that phil looked into last year for blue shark which i think is interesting is this idea of estimating stacking weights um, based on uh, leave future out predictive performance. And I think, as was mentioned before, um, looking at this to see how it does relative to uh, perhaps different management objectives to make sure that you're weighting models um, in a way that, that is consistent with, with um, 
managers are trying to do in the fishery is, is a good thing to do. And the last one is, is to compare performance across alternative model ensemble construction approaches. So uh, Matt and I did a paper where we just looked at the MCB approach and the grid approach, but there are a number of different approaches that exist, uh, the confounded factorial design and the uh, hierarchical hypothesis tree approach. And I think it would be useful to more fully document kind of the pros and cons of each different one so that analysts can pick the one that best fits their particular system um, and how they need to quantify risk. And yeah, that last bullet is I think we need a lot more closed loop simulation to answer some of these questions. So yeah, all done. Uh, thanks, Nicola. Um, we have time for a quick question. No, okay. Well, we'll move on to the next presentation. We have a lot of time for questions uh, in the discussion as well. So our next presentation is going to be slightly different. We're getting an outside view on uh, model averaging and weighting from the climate and weather forecasting um, field. And um, our speaker is Dathy Stone. Hey, um, thanks for inviting me to this. Um, I'll, I'm going to try to uh, keep this at a at a kind of colloquial level, hopefully, um, because I've noticed you know, in these presentations, I'm having a hard time keeping up with the lingo, and I hope not to, um, but I hope I can engage you um, by not introducing you to a whole pile of climate lingo. Um, th this issue uh, with, with, um, with models is something that the climate, um, climate change modeling community has been dealing with for a couple of decades, um, and there have been some lessons on that that perhaps might be useful here. Um, but I think one of the things I want to start off with and, um, and and get into more detail later is this thing of what we actually mean by models in the climate um, community, because uh, it, it differs a bit, um, I think, from, from a lot of what uh, is used uh, in the fisheries. So to start off, it's computer code used to simulate the climate system. I'll get into more detail about that. Um, but it's used to, um, for a whole number of purposes um, and uh, very diverse ones to understand how the climate works as a connected system, just kind of for scientific research. Um, for international policy in terms of trying to figure out how much we need to reduce our emissions in order to um, uh, stay below a, you know, a, a dangerous amount of climate change. Uh, to understand what our present and future hazards are climate-wise, because the past isn't a great uh, indication of the present or future. Um, so to understand how we need to adapt to climate change. And also, um, in a related way, to produce daily and seasonal weather forecasts. Um, so there's, there's some difference. These models are related. Um, they have different characteristics. But I think it's, it's important to understand that relation, um, and particularly to understand that these models are deterministic. So you start off from an initial state and they move forward. And you can see that kind of with the weather forecast. And we've got the recent case here of uh, tropical cyclone Gabrielle um, before it hit Norfolk Island. And this is the uh, New Zealand Met Service forecast of where it was going to go. And if you remember seeing the track afterwards, I should have an after plot. It more or less perfectly followed this track. This was actually a very well forecast event here. And if you go back several days, they were already knowing that it would hit New Zealand. It would interact with New Zealand. It wasn't quite clear which side. But um, by this time, they had refined the track this way. And the, the band here indicates some sort of uncertainty. And this is uncertainty because we don't quite know at any particular point in time what the state of the climate is. And so moving forward from that, 
you've got to account for that, that uncertainty. So we have a whole ecosystem of models. Um, you have uh, models that are designed to represent um, not just the atmosphere, but also the ocean, sea ice, um, a whole pile of atmospheric chemistry, the biosphere, ice sheets. Um, these are models really designed to understand how the climate system works and also to understand consequences of our interference with the climate system for you know, thousands of years in the future. Um, for the ice sheets, that tends to be, you know, we're talking thousands of years for the ultimate effect. Um, and it restricts down to models where we just look at the atmosphere um, and then ones where we just look at a region um, where it'll be embedded in other ones. And I've put down ocean models here, regional ocean models as well, because that seems relevant to this um, talk. All of these are process-based models, and I'll explain what that means in a little while. Um, there are also statistical downscaling models. These are um, techniques in which you correlate things that are happening at the larger scale which, what, with what happens locally, and you use that as an extrapolation exercise to figure out what's happening at your particular point, say. These are often portrayed as a hierarchy. This is just because of the way the climate, system, climate modelers work. They think they're on top. Um, but it's really different models for different purposes. So I think, um, as we've seen in previous talks, th this is all centering around the question of why should I believe your model? Um, by the way, I have 20 minutes, is it, from 20 minutes ago? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and I've kind of expressed these as a who, how, what, and why. Um, and I'll, I'll go through these in detail, but to summarize, the uh, who the climate model was constructed by people I trust, how the climate model calculates the solutions to basic physical, perhaps chemistry, uh, chemical, and so on equations, uh, or laws of nature, what the climate model makes testable predictions, which have been evaluated against observations, and uh, finally, why um, your climate model provide, provides me with something different from other models or information sources. So look at the who, the climate model source. Of course, we're getting into a bit of politics here. Um, you can count a lot of money was spent developing this climate model. You're going to use it whether you like it or not. Um, and they're, they're uh, certainly at the you know, international scale, do these sorts of things where you kind of, um, these international reports have to kind of consider all of the models available, give each model a vote. Um, otherwise, you're you know, this country that spent a lot working on this climate model is suddenly being told they're not worthy. Um, but you have some oddities coming out of that as well. Um, this is a um, back from um, about 20 years ago, um, the generation of climate models then were produced, um, predicting a range of what's known as the climate sensitivity, um, which is basically if you double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, how does the planet eventually warm? And they were predicting that to kind of be in the one to two degree range. And uh, there was this one model, a Japanese one, that was saying it was uh, th over three degrees. And um, they didn't like the fact that they were an outlier, so they actually requested that their value not be included in the report. Um, but you can see that this uh, distribution function that's kind of plotted on top here is actually the observational constraints. And they were actually representing a whole area of, of um, what we can kind of see from other sources of information seems plausible that wasn't being accounted for by other models. And in fact, in the most recent case, you've got um, the, the, one of the big US models and the big UK model are predicting high climate sensitivities. And they didn't request that they get, partly because of um, knowledge we've gained over the past several years, but probably also a bit of cultural issues as well. They didn't request that they get removed from the report. Um, it can be a proxy for other reasons. Um, just, I'm not gonna bother um, myself, you know, bother considering um, something that's produced by hotmodels at gmail.com. Um, 
So it's kind of a basic filter for what's competent. Um, there's also, it can be a proxy for models that are specifically tailored for your use as well. And that, um, for instance, New Zealand has a, 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 an elaboration of an of a international model, um, which is being referred to as NZESM, um, which is designed, has tweaks to it, which are designed to improve representation of the atmosphere and ocean in the vicinity of New Zealand. So if I'm looking at New Zealand, that might be one that I'm interested in, in considering um, outright. How? Um, so this is the question of what climate models are. They actually, they, they solve um, equations for the laws of physics. So just got a couple of examples here. Um, you know, the, the bottom one there is just saying basically that the amount of heat coming, the amount of energy coming in um, has to equal the amount of energy going out or else the temperature has to change. Um, and these are kind of basic thermodynamic laws, right? Um, the second one from the bottom is saying the same, same sort of thing for mass, that the amount of mass that you put in, you have, if you put mass in, some mass has to come out from somewhere else. So um, you put these together into a climate model, you solve them um, by gridding the whole uh, planet. Um, so typical climate models, global climate models today will run at a grid scale of about 100 to 200 kilometers, um, which can, of course can make New Zealand seem look a bit strange. Um, and you've got uh, latitude, longitude, and vertical element to those grids. And so you solve these equations at each point and it's all um, connected. Um, so this means, of course, that if you run, you've got the butterfly effect. This is a very chaotic system. So um, you tweak the initial state and you're running the climate system on, it will diverge um, over a period of, of about a week. That's why the weather forecasts only go out about a week into the future. Um, there will still be some lingering stuff for about another year. That's where um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation adds a bit of predictability. And beyond that, they're basically kind of doing their own thing. Um, and they can run then for thousands of years. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. And they will look, a good model will look very similar to the real world statistically in terms of how it's going, but it won't match it exactly. There's a problem, of course, here. There's a caveat to all of this, and that's that lots of things happen at spatial scales smaller than these 100 kilometer grid boxes. Um, basically the entire development of clouds, and clouds are extremely important. So these are represented by kind of a combination things of, of um, rules that are partly based on first principles and partly heuristic, um, partly empirical. So kind of the observation that clouds tend to form when the relative humidity reaches a certain value. Rain tends to happen when it reaches a slightly higher value. Um, and of course, these, these sorts of parameters then that are going into it are actually a, a, an uncertain quantity um, that lead to a lot of the big uncertainties in climate models. So you have these differences between models, um, this inclusion of systems. Do you have the ocean in there or not? For instance, ice sheets or not? Um, the numerics, how you're solving things. Um, so this is the grade, the resolution of the spatial grid, the time stepping, um, but also the, I guess, more computationally, the sort of numerical scheme you're actually using to solve the, all the equations, the numerical precision, the numbers you're working with. And then you have these things with subgrid um, boxes. Um, so how rain is formed, turbulence, all of those processes that are happening at small scales. And uh, the effects of these vary depending whether you're looking at the global scale or the local scale. So it ends up what's happening ironically in this small scale is actually very important for the global scale because um, if you're concerned about global temperatures, because that's very much controlled by how much how, how many clouds you have. Um, and so if you tweak how easily clouds can form, that can change things dramatically. Um, whereas it might have less of an effect at a local scale. Um, so moving on to the what climate model performance. So um, 
These models are constructed from first principles. Sometimes things work out quite well, sometimes not quite so well, and you go through uh, various iterations and so on. On the left-hand side, we have an Australian model that um, uh, I've, I've, we're plotting here various aspects of um, uh, sea ice um, concentration um, and the ocean surface temperature around New Zealand. Um, uh, basically a transect from the, um, uh, from the equator to the pole. And uh, it looks rather good. It, it fits the, the model. There are a number of simulations going in there, uh, just with slightly different initial conditions. Um, there are the red lines and the blue are observa it's observations. And I want to um, point, I don't know if this comes out. Yeah, it does. Um, with the sea ice here, it actually fits the sea ice concentration quite nicely there. Here's a, a different model that, um, this, is, this is for winter, by the way, it lacks sea ice around Antarctica in the winter. It might be a bit of a problem if you're looking at New Zealand. Um, but there is a caution here that you have to be careful idolizing observations too much. Um, go into detail here too much but the the dots here the the black dots are um estimations and regional land areas in the world each about two million square kilometers wide for um the annual hottest day of the year and uh the black so the black dots are from various free-running climate models and the open circles are from various observational data sets and the spread's more or less equal in a lot of these areas. Um, so that, that creates a problem in terms of actually evaluating um, our, our models. But sometimes the observations are not quite up to it. Um, finally, the why, diversity. Um, so this figure here is, is a tree in, um, in which they, uh, two different methods, that's the, the kind of inset there is, is a different method in which they've, um, as you go um, fr from left, you're looking at the, or sorry, fr um, so, so the, linking up um, on the left-hand side, models whose output looks the most similar. And as you go out gradually, you're looking at um, more distant, uh, dissimilar models as you go on. And this is based entirely on the output. The models are labeled there, and you'll see there are colors. That indicates that these models are related. So um, some of them might be related just because they're kind of different versions of um, the same model, one which includes atmospheric chemistry, one which doesn't. Or they might be cases like the NZESM, which is an adaptation of a UK model so that New Zealand has done. What you can see is that the, these two match up very closely. So actually um, models that are closely related end up producing very similar output. So we want to extract information from multiple models. Um, these are very expensive models to run. They use a, up a very large fraction of the world's supercomputing capacity. Um, I don't know how they've gotten away with it for so long. Um, and so you, you want to kind of uh, think about how to use that information. All of this, there must be something in there. So one thing you could do is, is uh, select or reject models through some sort of binary weighting. And um, you might, for instance, look at that plot I was looking at. If you're worried about uh, looking at sea ice around Antarctica, then you might outright throw out that model that doesn't have sea ice. Um, you might give preference to favored models through, through some form of weighting. Um, and you might actually extend this and that your climate models may not be the only source of information. Um, if you're looking at trying to understand what the climate is right now, then you might be interested in looking at the observational record as well, for instance, that might tell you something. Um, and then you, you've got these very different types of information. How do you combine them? 
this is all getting very Bayesian. Um, and because it's, it's Bayesian, you start having to be very careful about how you do things. So um, this is that climate sensitivity parameter again. This is the posterior distribution that's being shown here um, for the, this climate sensitivity. So the, the warming that happens if you double carbon dioxide concentrations. And um, this is, comes from a multi-model ensemble with weighting applied. So in the uh, green line, it's also kind of the, the, there's an overlapping dash black line, which is very similar there. So that's the middle one. You have um, the weight, weighting or has been performed um, with a uniform prior on the models. So assuming that the models are randomly um, spanning some sort of space relevant for climate sensitivity. Now for um, various obscure reasons, uh, climate se sensitivity is often measured according to its inverse, just one over the climate sensitivity. Um, that's just how it kind of appears in, in a lot of um, simple models. Um, so you might think, well, maybe I should wait on that because that's actually how this appears in the models. So uh, you um, impose a, pri a uniform prior on that um, inverse and you get the blue posterior, um, which looks a bit different. You're getting about uh, a half degree cooler there. And you might say, but wait a second, it's actually climate sensitivity itself that I'm interested in, in which case your uniform prior should actually be on climate sensitivity. And so then you get the orange uh, distribution. And that's probably the one you're interested in, because it's the, it's actually the, in this case anyway, the quantity you're actually interested in. The implication, of course, which um, we've been kind of has been a discussion here, is that you might need different weighting systems for different outputs, different quantities of interest. Um, just a quick warning that you want to be careful not to overweight. Um, this is just a, a case that was pointed out uh, what, about 15 years ago, um, my colleague, that um, the predictions of how climate change or uh, where it's going to progress in the future, we're actually more confident than we were about climate change in the past. Um, kind of an irony in terms of how um, the Bayesian weighting had been applied. So just a couple of examples here of how all of this actually gets put into practice, which might be the um, most interesting part for you here after all that preamble. Um, this is a, an example from a recent paper um, where they're interested in global mean temperature, global average temperature. And uh, you've got all these climate models arranged at the bottom here, and they've considered three different ways of weighting them. The gray triangles are um, weighting according to how independent they are in their output. So this model, whether this model looks similar to another one or whether it's actually very different in the way it behaves. So trying to get diversity across models. The gray dots, uh, sorry, the gray squares are um, based on how well they perform against some, some uh, observational um, data. And the uh, black line then is, is where they kind of combine those two metrics, um, what you get. So you get uh, some models that, that seem to be um, uh, getting a much higher rating, uh, weighting, um, and then kind of a, a gradual tail off. So one of the things actually you can see is the, after only about half a dozen models, you're, you're basically, you're getting much less information from the rest of the models. So you're looking at that sort of order of models out of this diversity of probably about 30 models we have here, about half a dozen are actually containing most of the information. So you can apply that. So this is uh, that, those, that weighting. Um, to the uh, future global climate. Um, so kind of predicting how temperatures are gonna change in the future. So let's just kind of consider the, um, the orange curve here, um, which is a case where we just keep on emitting carbon dioxide um, as we are right now. The gray 
band, which you can't really see on the screen there too well, um, is uh, with the blue line, or I guess kind of gray line in the middle of it, is um, the unweighted ensemble of climate models. And the orange with the orange line is what you get after weighting. So there's been some effect of weighting in this. It's actually changed the, the output. Um, but is that actually informative? Um, we can look at two cases where it isn't terribly informative. On the right-hand side, to start off, um, you've got a case. So in this case, they're, they're using this. Let's pretend that one of these models will take it out, and we'll pretend it's the observation. So we know what the model actually does. Um, and that's what you get with the dotted line, is what it actually does. And this model is a bit of an outlier, um, particularly there. Um, if you look at the blue scenario, it tends to, it's, it's outside of this, this, I guess, probably 10 to 95, 10 to 90% band uh, um, that the blue represents. So the problem is, of course, is that even, no matter how weight, much you weight your, um, your models, you can't get outside of the range that the models provide. Um, and on the left hand side, you have this uh, curious case where it's actually the weighted ensemble is actually further from the target. So the things that have been waiting from seem to be anti correlated for whatever reason. Um, so in this particular study, the prediction was um, about 15 was worse 15% of the time. Which I guess is is not too bad, but still isn't perfect. Um, another example would be just looking at uh, the exercise we're going through at NIWA right now to produce kind of the next um, generation of uh, predictions of how climate change will evolve over New Zealand. Um, for this, we're taking data from uh, global models that have been run around the world, and we're um, technically using regional climate models to, to focus in on New Zealand um, to, to um, resolve New Zealand in that. So, um, so what we want is models that are doing a good job in the New Zealand area to, to kind of then focus them in on New Zealand. On the left-hand side is an evaluation I performed, which was just looking at how well the models are dealing with um, producing the sea ice around New, uh, south of New Zealand, how they are in, um, in terms of the uh, north to south temperature gradient in the ocean around New Zealand and the uh, trend over the past several decades around New Zealand in, in the sea ice. And um, basically I kind of integrated all of this into this um, kind of five star metric on the right. So some models doing, seem to be doing quite well. They've got five, there's one model that gets five stars, a number that gets uh, four or even three. There are some models that are only getting uh, one star. Um, in the red are the highlighted are the models, uh, along with a couple of others that aren't in this plot that we've decided to use. Now you'll notice that they're not all four or five star models. We've actually got a couple of two star models in there. One of the reasons is that we could evaluate according to more things in the New Zealand area. Where be, um, there are aspects in the atmosphere. Do they have the winds in the right place? And if you look at that, that's kind of a measure um, in, in the plot on the right there. Uh, this horizontal measure, if you're further to the left, that much more holistic evaluation is saying that the models are, are better and perhaps confusingly this metric, which is my one, um, the higher it is, the better they are. So, um, in this case, I think these are the models that we're taking or amongst them, the, the kind of blue ones. Um, so this is the region you want to be in where we're, we're good on both metrics, but you'll see there's very little correlation happening here um, between the two metrics. So it's, it's, you get, often get this, that actually there doesn't seem to be all that much that's informative. So just a, a couple of final summarizing thoughts. Um, combining information from different models and other sources is hard. I think you all know that, that's why you're here. Um, 
there's been quite a bit of thinking on this in climate uh, for climate models uh, for a couple of decades, uh, a lot um, involving uh, statisticians getting um, working on the problem, um, a lot of theoretical work, a lot of practical work and testing it. But the usage is still limited in a strictly probabilistic sort of sense. But it has been a useful exercise in understanding how to extract information. So um, in the New Zealand case, for instance, I was describing there, there's really no model weighting happening. We're kind of um, partly restricted by the computational cost we have of doing this, this um, focusing in on the regional scale. Um, and so we could only select a few models. We've picked them to be diverse and representative of the range of possibilities that, I think are, that we think are going to happen. That's another reason why some of the lower star models are there, because they're giving something that's different. Um, so understanding these contributions to what provides information, I think, has been a very useful exercise that comes out of this. Thanks. OK, thanks, Daisy. Um, are there any questions or comments? No. No. Yeah, Phil has a comment or question. Um, yeah, I, I thought that, um, I guess uh, the, the point you mentioned about essentially constructing a prior of the outcome space in your ensemble, I think that's that's a really important one to me um i guess in the past I've, I've thought about it in you know in terms of a single model essentially and you know and, and most of our quantities of interest even in single models aren't observable and you know but the quantities of interest are essentially you know the the, the priors that we set often have unintended consequences there and i guess in the ensemble context i just wondered how it plays out in practice if you have any, any um, information on that? I guess what is then ultimately used to weight the models, or or is it just the prior essentially that goes goes into that weighting, or what else goes into the weighting that um, that ultimately produces that distribution? Um, I guess you'd have a uh, a combination of factors going to your priors. So, like you were talking about. Your thing. So one of them is having starting off with a uniform prior on this outcome. So in that example I showed uh, earlier, uh, here, yes. So you'd, you'd give a high weighting at the outset to this model right here, just because it's characterizing something that your other models aren't telling you anything about. Who knows if it's right or not, but it's telling you something different um, for the quantity that you're interested in. Um, but then you might go through some other sta steps where you're then comparing it according to um, how it performs, according to some sort of ob observed measure that you think is related to this thing that you're trying to predict. Perhaps it's performance in predicting that sort of quantity in the past. And in that case, it might get downweighted rather strongly, um, or it might. You know, the, you'd, you'd have this, these multiple sources of weights going in there. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Nicholas. Yeah. Um, improvements in in climate and weather forecasting have been. I'm not mistaken, pretty marked in the last few decades. Um, just curious, has that been better measurement of that, those initial states? Has it been better system equations or has it been ensemble modeling or all the above? Partly all of the above. I think a major part of it has been um, the observations. Um, satellite observations in particular are crucial. I mean, if you, if you go back and look at the kind of the early 80s where you first really started getting weather satellites coming in, that really, um, the ones that were providing more than just pictures 
um, that really changed uh, how the weather forecast worked because we were suddenly, especially in the southern hemisphere, you know, around outside of around New Zealand, there was very little information of what was happening. Um, you might have the odd ship or plane going around there, otherwise we didn't know. Um, suddenly the satellites were telling us everything. There was some error in what they were telling us. Um, it might not have always been properly calibrated, but they were telling us something that we didn't know. Um, so that, that was a big step change. Um, more recently, a lot of it's also been um, typical the climate models or weather forecast models are running at finer and fire and a resolution. Um, also a better understanding of what their uncertainties are. So the uncertainties in the forecast and running that forward through time. So how to produce these initial condition ensembles, what actually is the uncertainty in your initial state. Okay, any other questions or comments? By you, Carolina. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. You you showed uh, like um, a phylogeny of models, or uh, when you when you get to choose models for your ensemble, uh, how do you do you use any of that phylogeny? Like if they are too similar, you might not include them, or or um, any criterion there to be to be uh, included in your ensemble. Yes, yeah, so that um, in in this case, in this example, for instance, um, that is the these triangles are representing the a weighting based on how related they are um, using data about that come out of the models, and so figuring out whether they're related or not based on that. So the the way this tree has been constructed on the right hand side. Um, in this case, in this case, um, where we've been uh, selecting uh, six models, seven models, it's um, a large part of it is by the, the, the name on the model and what institution it came from. Um, so is it a related model or not? Um, we've also looked in terms of their rate of warming, um, looking at, at getting diversity there. But it, so it's kind of being a, a bit of a combination of uh, going in from the, the left here, just looking at the color on the models um, and a little bit on coming in from the right. But it, that hasn't been done in a, um, it's kind of been done sitting around a table arguing a bit um, without a specific, you know, quantitative um, analysis. Yeah, Carolyn, follow up. Another follow up, just curious, like, when you get a, an extreme weather event, for example, the cyclone and all that, do you use that data, that prediction to, like, validate models or to increase your your um, faith, let's say, on each one of the models, or is not used in the for future use? Uh, yes, yes, and no. Um, yes, in the sense that for weather forecasting, absolutely, um, because of course a big part of weather forecasting is is getting those worrying events. Um, that's that's where where it becomes most useful um, for kind of climate modeling in a statistical sort of sense, yes. And we're kind of looking at our climate models right now. Do they produce these sorts of storms coming down? They're way too weak because they're not being properly resolved, but do they actually have these things um, coming down from the tropics? Um, and, and so we're, we're interested in that because uh, for an adaptation point of view, if you're worried about um, the, where to put infrastructure, in New Zealand in the next 30 years, um, you might be concerned about what's going to be happening with these storms. So, so we want to actually have them. Yeah. Okay, okay. thanks. I th have, have them in the models, not have them in the real world, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think we should move on to the general discussion period now, but um, we can have questions for all three, um, or four, was it four, four presenters.
um, or questions on any topic uh, related to model waiting. So does anyone want to bring anything up? Yeah, Dan. Yeah, so I'm very impressed with uh, Phil and, uh, and Nicholas' presentation. Really, some very in-depth thoughts about uh, you know, those topics. But I, I just wonder. I mean, those discussions should we kind of this in terms of model assemble buildings and waiting? Should we distinguish between and models we use for the assessment and the models we use, you know, in a MSC sort of context. Um, but in terms of building the model assembly, I guess some of the general principles, I, I suppose, they applies to to both, right? I mean, you know, you're, in both cases, you need to kind of build different hypotheses in terms of different model structure and you know in, integrates parameter uncertainty. I think those principles should apply in both in, in both. But maybe in an MSC situation, you need sort of a larger model ensembles. But in terms of model weighting, I just it seems to me I seldom how those kind of discussion happen in the MSC context. I just wonder why, and is that because in the MSC we at least worry about you know the estimation bias, and you know it's used for more of a evaluate system performance. Um, yeah, that's just uh, some sort. Thank you. Any comments on that? Rich. I, I guess they're doing different jobs. I mean, if you're doing it for a stock assessment, someone's asking you for a number of something, right, to do something. And I think in the MSE sense, when if you're struggling to weight hypotheses, or the best you can do is qualitative, you just separate them, you know, you just say, okay, this is an alternative. Someone might agree that this is our most likely the sort of reference case, everything else are relatively less plausible, but still plausible. So you just want to see how they perform in a relative risk sense across all of them, because you, ultimately you're not you're not being asked to give that particular management advice number. You just want to see how things perform in a relative sense. It's a bit easier in the MSE because you don't have to worry so much that you can't weight different sort of robustness test hypotheses or whatever or it, it's not as important but i think in the assessment sense you're being asked to do a bit more you know to to take into account those different hypotheses and have a think about what weight you would give them to give a combined set of advice that, that's a bit of a harder one i think yeah thanks rich yeah i think it's the msc is more about robustness where the assessments are more about predict uh well estimation um Anything else? There's, there's one thing I want to bring up. Oh, um, Phil. Yeah. Okay. So the, the one thing I want to uh, bring up and well, oh, there's a couple of things, but um, it was interesting that uh, Phil says that the risk analysis based on diagnostic was the gold standard, which is the one that I developed with our team. I actually think it's not a very good approach. Um, and the reason for that is that diagnostics should really be, well, most diagnostics should be really for eliminating models or identifying models that need to be fixed and fixing models. Um, and that flows into the um, use of fit to the data to weight your models. And that's really how we should be doing it. The problem is we don't really have, we haven't, um, got the good practices for producing the likelihoods, weighting the likelihoods and things like that. So our model fit is not really a good measure of the reliability of the model. Um, but when we do these things, we use diagnostics to, to weight the models, but then we use the estimates of the parameter uncertainty to represent the uncertainty, and that's based on the fit to the data. So we're doing something that's inconsistent. We're saying we don't want to use it to weight models, so we use diagnostics, but then we use it to weight parameter uncertainty. So what what do people think about that? And have they got an alternative that we should be using? Yeah, Phil. Yeah, I think it actually talks to what I was what I was going to mention or question. Um I think, you know, I, at the moment, there's the there's a practical imperative, right, to produce 
I mean, you, you still have to go through the stock assessment process. You, you can't do infinite amounts of research into understanding how all of these properties interact to give that management advice because you'd, you'd never give it. And so, so I think that practical imperative, and that's kind of where I mean, you know, it, it's, it's an iterative process. I think at the moment, the, you know, using a range of diagnostics, sort of hedging our bets and, you know, and, and using those for weighting is probably as good as we can do because we don't have that necessary understanding to do much more. Um, but I guess for me, that also highlights a sort of big research need and, and perhaps, perhaps a, a, I guess a question of whether it should be best practice to, uh, to accompany the, um, the development of ensembles and the development of the overall approaches to weighting ensembles with closed loop simulation to understand how those weighting schemes, for example, perform and what they ultimately um, select in the you know in the ensemble. So, so I think I think perhaps it it ought to go hand in hand that you know that you do the simulations at the time when you set those schemes up, and then you might want to adjust, for example, your weighting scheme towards things that are actually weighting you know quantities that you're interested in, because I think one of the things that you know that is obviously more difficult than in climate systems is that the quantities that we're interested in are not are not inherently not measurable and so and so we 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 can only really get at it through the closed loop simulation we can't really get at it by just comparing to you know how well do these models perform or these diagnostics you know lead us towards the truth and so so i think like for me it the sort of idealized scenario would be something where we use this sort of tree approach but we use closed loop simulation to get us you know to sort of a as near an optimal kind of weighting scheme as we could get. Yeah, Rich. Yeah, I think you've raised a good point, Mark, in that I think with the diagnostics, one of the things it's difficult to explain what it is you get at the end in terms of you get a distribution of possible things, but it's not, it's not really what it is. And it, I think that, that that's like a, almost a break in the chain that Phil was talking about of that Bayesian sense, because if you're defining the weighting scheme for the models, on something that you can't really explain in a probabilistic sense, that's broken that thing in the chain and that makes it really hard to discuss things like probabilities at the end of the chain when it comes to the management quantities. You can still show summaries of things and all that kind of thing, but I think it makes it hard to go all the way to talk about probabilities. Um, but yeah, it's a real challenge with the, the CCSPT stuff uses a mix of likelihoods and priors. So, it's, some, it's still convoluted, really. But you can give some sort of explanation as to what that distribution is in terms of a, the conditional structure of it at the end. And you can sort of, as long as you're talking rel you know, relative to that structure, you can talk about probabilities of things. But I think with the diagnostics, it's a bit trickier to, to go that far. Um, and I think, yeah, that's one of the challenges with diagnostics that are good for diagnosing problems and assessments, but not that intuitive as a house, you're supposed to use them in a probabilistic weighting sense. Yeah, Dorothy. Oh, that's automatic. Oh, yeah. It is. Um, yeah, there, you, you, you can't get entirely away from that problem. So um, our as I said, the climate models are built from the base up, but you have this natural selection effect um, that models that are doing really poorly might kind of fall to the wayside, right? And, or, or people are less interested, people won't select them so much for their studies, it won't be as useful to everyone else. So everyone wants to have the best model. Everyone's trying to have the best model. No one's trying to have the worst model or the kind of somewhat bad model, but actually that's to some degree that's needed. And so trying to encourage that, make sure you get some sort of diversity out there is probably the, I mean, that's the best balance we've come up with in the climate modeling community is to try to have some sort of um, diversity, maybe make different versions of the model, which have, in which you've tweaked parameters a little bit and you get some sort of um, diversity out of it through these different versions, um, even though one might be your favorite. So, any, any comments on 
on that. So I've got a question. So it seemed as though you were looking for models that gave diversity in the result. But that's kind of more like our MSE approach where we're looking for management strategies that are robust to things as opposed to say our stock assessment which is we're trying to get the best estimate so we 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 might want to include diversity in the models that we consider but we wouldn't want diversity in the results unless it was supported by the data or the diagnostics or something else right yeah i should i should clarify that um looking for diversity and things in which there is actually fundamentally uncertainty there might be something which the all all of the models agree and they all agree specifically on that and there's a very good reason why they do um, and so that's fine and in that case model weighting kind of becomes irrelevant and so it's just these cases where you have um, where you're trying to predict something which doesn't have a direct relationship to an observable that you can just easily extrapolate on um, and so and which there's some broad range of uncertainty which has a consequence and in that case, you want your models to be representing that range of uncertainty. If they're, um, you know, we, I think we saw this, um, that climate sensitivity parameter is a funny story because it was a report back in 1979 in which uh, there were two models, a, a national US report. They're, they had two climate models at the time. One said it was two degrees, the other said four. So they decided it was between 1.5 and four and a half. In uh, 1990, they had the, IP, the first international report. Uh, they looked at very, what they had available and kind of thought that was consistent with 1.5 to 4.5 degrees. Go, go forward to um, seven years ago, the report was still saying 1.5 to 4.5 degrees. And part of that was supported by observations, but part was also because that's what had been said before. And so there was this thing where I think a lot of climate models, oh, that, that climate sensitivity looks a bit high. Let's try to modify our model so it's more within the pack. We don't want to be an outlier. But no, you need that outlier if it's supported by possible evidence. OK, thanks. Um, any other comments or questions on model averaging? I, I've got a question about um including models that are correlated and this came up at the workshop on uh, model averaging last year is that and and you were talking about that in in fisheries how how would we do it with a stock assessment model that's correlated and is it a problem that we have when we do our model averaging i mean a lot of our models are correlated because we start with a base model and then we make look at all the different uncertainties around it. Um, but in the past, there was places where, which may be a bit more like the um, climate modeling, where you have multiple teams putting in models, and each team wants their model to be part of the, the ensemble, but you might have two stock synthesis models and one surplus production model. So that would mean that stock synthesis models would get twice the weight as a surplus production model. So that, are there any cases now that we're using where there's correlation among models that we should really take into consideration? No, Carolina, that, yeah. Well, I was thinking more like there's in the parameter uncertainty space, right? You will have growth and natural mortality correlated and some combinations will not be like will not be uh, um, possible in nature like there's the, the because of the selection natural selection basically so in this case you will have to take into account the correlations otherwise you're going to have a lot of models that are going to fail right yeah so so that was actually a different type of correlation but it's an important one um, the correlation I'm talking about is like in our risk analysis, we have the hierarchy, right? We, we don't want to put too much weight on one set of models because we have 10 different versions of the, the regime shift model and only five versions of the non-regime shift model. 
So if we gave those all those models equal weight, then the regime shift model would get more weight. But because we have that hierarchy where with prior probability of whether regime shift was true or not, then we've actually structured that out, particularly because we are normalizing the probabilities at the lower uh, levels of the hierarchy. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. Yeah. No, so in the, that that case, well, I I think uh, well, we kind of think the same. This is why we choose that that it has to be conditional, right, in, in each step of the hierarchy. Otherwise, really, you're going to influence the, the weight too much. I don't know what other people might think. Nicola, you have a question. You're holding the mic, so it seems like you think you might want to ask the question. I mean, I, yeah, I guess on the same, the same topic, I mean, at some point, your, your estimating models of the same stock with more or less the same data, there's there's going to be a very high degree of, of correlation between models. Um, and I think I think that's perhaps one of the nice things about that hierarchical approach is that you can kind of partition off different structural assumptions and that perhaps breaks up some of that correlation a little bit, even if they're fitting to the same data, they're they might be more independent than if you're just integrating over, you know, parameter uncertainty. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, but I think that kind of hierarchical approach is, is probably a reasonable one to go forward with. Okay, thanks. Um, the question, does anyone want to follow up on Carolina, Carolina's question about the correlated parameters and in the sense that you know a high m and a high k is probably not something that's um likely um and how to deal with that because i know if you're fitting to the data obviously that will eliminate the the uh, parameter space that doesn't work but again we we don't like fitting to the data i mean using the the fit to the data as a weighting metric because we haven't got our data weighting and all that sorted out um and a lot of the models that people are using the ensemble models are basically just grids and so there's no weighting for the data at all so there's often using the high k i m scenario even though it may not be a realistic scenario yeah phil yeah, that's that's exactly the problem that we had with um, South Pacific Blue Shark, and we ended up moving towards estimating M as essentially a diagnostic for models that were inconsistent. And I guess curiously, when when we fixed it, it wasn't all that apparent that there was a set of models that were actually, you know, biologically inconsistent. But when you when you fitted M, you know the the ones that had essentially we had two growth assumptions and one had much higher growth, and you know those models with with you know with that growth essentially ended up also producing models that had really implausible M estimates, and so and so you know I guess that's that's partly where I'm coming from with you know if you, if you can fit it I think it's a better diagnostic than you know having to do it all post hoc and and figure you know and and so I think it's it's usually worth a try and then you can see what it what it comes out with I think rather than you know a priori putting things like that into a grid which is was actually where I started because I kind of assumed that our data aren't that great it's sharks the link frequencies aren't particularly great and so you know my a priori assumption was that it wasn't really worth trying but it turned out it probably it probably was and so I I think that may be an approach for those types of parameters where, you know, if, if you can estimate at least one of them, that might be able to eliminate parts of parameter space that are implausible. Yeah, Nicola. Yeah, I, I agree with Phil on that. I think, and people that are more experienced uh, Bayesians can correct me if I'm grossly misapplying something, but I think that's also somewhere where we can buy borrow the idea of kind of the uh the push forward the prior push forward check um just to see if there are things in the ensemble that 
obviously don't play nice with each other um kind of as a a common sense test and an iterative development of i guess refining the ensemble space yeah carolina i don't know exactly what you mean with this power push forward but when we would use some catch only models in, in some exercise um, um i did what i was calling like the the pre-data posterior or or the um yeah so i i just took the all the uh, the parameter space and and I added to the model right a simple model and then see what parameter combinations are completely impossible so this is kind of like the pre-data <laughs> uh, posterior uh, of that model it was a, a, a SIR algorithm, so it was possible to do it that way, and then add the data, because most of the information was coming from the combination of the parameters, not from actually the data. That's how you, we were able to see that. I think that's, that's the same thing that I'm, that I'm talking about, yeah. Okay, any other comments or questions? I guess follow up on this is that um, at the previous workshop and in, in, in the, the, um, the review in ecological literature, the sort of conclusion was data, data weighting wasn't really that, I mean, sorry, data weighting, I'm getting mixed up, model weighting wasn't that it wasn't that important it was more about making sure no stupid models got in your in your ensemble and it seemed as though from the the ic's analyses that the the actual model weighting wasn't that influential and i was wondering is is this something that people have seen before that it's more about excluding models than it is is weighting the models and i mean in and in the weather forecasting and climate forecasting is do you see the same similar thing as well this is for me right <laughs> <laughs> Um, for certain purposes, there are some bad mod climate models out there, and so it's important to get rid of them. Um, they can be doing some very strange things. These often have to do with threshold effects. So. Um, I mean, the example of that model without the sea ice around Antarctica, just it, it's a bit too warm. Um, it might be doing year to year variability fine and things like that, but it doesn't have the sea ice. So, uh, and the sea ice changes everything that's happening there. So, you know, suddenly that becomes very important. Whereas if you were, you know, 2000 kilometers east of New Zealand, it mightn't matter quite so much that you have that temperature bias because you don't have the temperature threshold effect. So sometimes it's it's for specific things that it becomes very important. Um, and so then it becomes important to rule them out. Um, so you, it kind of goes around threshold effects. And in that case, I guess, a um, throwing it out because it's bad kind of parallels the threshold issue I, yeah thanks phil you had a comment yeah I mean, we we saw the same thing in the in the blue shark example where essentially once we'd eliminated models that we thought were just implausible in terms of their combinations of growth and and natural mortality that or in terms of the natural mortality that came out under certain growth scenarios the model weighting did very little out the end and we tried we used hindcast model weights and um and also estimating stacking weights and in both scenarios essentially the you know the distribution of outcomes essentially remain relatively unchanged whereas you know removing a set of models 
made a massive difference. It removed most of the you know extremely positive models in terms of stock status. Um, so it really truncated that distribution, you know, into sort of almost in half. So that was a much more influential um, step than the ultimate weighting. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah I was just going to add that in my limited applications for for looking at weighting within within model ensembles for Southwest Pacific swordfish. Yeah the we try to likelihood well in a subset of the models we try to likelihood weighting scheme and that showed almost no difference from equal weights um and another we tried another weighting scheme based on uh hind casting of cpue um where taking that that mean absolute squared error and, and trying the inverse of that and trying to convert it into a into a weight um and you had to do a pretty extreme, uh, I guess, waiting on good Heimcast performance to to get a distribution of uh, model quantities that differed substantially from uh, the equal weighting. Um, and yeah, I guess if the IC's team is is still online, I noticed that their their weighting scheme uh, generated look like almost equal weights across the board and, and i just wonder the models that they were down weighting based on diagnostics how different of a result were you getting from the other ones um yeah is or i mean they had they had slightly worse diagnostics but were they telling you something materially different from the ones that had good diagnostics i guess yeah actually that's quite an interesting point to to, if you're plotting all your models, I mean, if you, you know, if you plot all your models and look at, look at the ones that were rejected by different diagnostics and see where they fell, and if they fell sort of randomly in the ones that you kept, then you kind of have some more confidence that your your model would be ro robust to a lot more than what you've actually included in the ensemble because even models that you thought were unrealistic but just maybe you got it wrong for some really reason and they were realistic you're still um robust to it but if they fell all outside it then um that might give you an, a reason to maybe look a little closer to make sure that they were unrealistic models i guess just to follow up with that in the not in the 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 swordfish paper but an actual the actual swordfish assessment one of the things that we did on the back end was this post hoc filtering um and some of the things that we we filtered for were maybe some parameters on bounds or parameters that were blowing up um whether the model had converged with the hessian or not and and some of those filtering steps the models that you took out versus the models that you kept the distribution of management quantities didn't really change um and so those models I guess you could argue for keeping them in um, because it, even though there was something wrong with that model, it, it, it wasn't telling you anything any different. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend keeping them in, but you could note in the management advice that similar management advice would be uh, estimated from the models that were excluded. Yeah. Um, I got a question on hind casting. I'm bring, bringing it up again since hind casting is being promoted as the way to weight ensembles. Um, and again, sort of the hind casting is based on a prediction of an observation that's not the management. So, are we still confident that we should be using hind casting? And if we are confident, which what what data should we be hind casting for what management quantities? Yeah, Phil. Yeah, I think um, I think Jim made a really good comment earlier that you know there's there may be models where you're you're you know if you if you have relatively flat CPUE if your length frequencies aren't moving much over time at least recently you may have really lovely forecasting skill for all of those models and a lot of those maybe for all the wrong reasons you know you may have uh, 
completely the wrong M estimate in there, for example. And, you know, from a dynamic point of view, from a management advice point of view, essentially that, you know, that M and or the wrong steepness will translate into, you know, possibly the wrong management advice and the hindcasting won't tell you that, right? And I think that for me, fundamentally, it probably quite system specific and, you know, and, and depending on how much information the data that you're using your diagnostic on, and, you know, in this case, hindcasting has about the quantity of interest that we're actually looking at, which is, you know, stock status or ultimately management utility. And so I think unless you can do that in a closed loop simulation to show that it actually does weight that properly, you know, I think it's it's a very strong assumption to make that leap from, you know, from an from an observable that is may or may not be well related to what you're actually getting at. And it may it may actually be that, you know, a different weight, for example, on length frequencies or something has a much, you know, is much better because it it might weight your M estimate towards something more plausible, for example. Right. And and so in that case you may be choosing the wrong one if you're picking CPUE. Okay. Yeah, Annie. Yeah. Thanks for bringing this subject up. I was also thinking about it this morning, and I thought I'd missed the train now. That, uh, but uh, exactly, uh, I, I made the comment earlier this morning that SPC will do uh, probably a, a couple more diagnostics than in the past. But sort of, I thought to myself, well, hand casting will probably not be one of them for the following reasons. We. Yeah, hand casting CPU. We have uh, nine CPU indices. They don't change very much between years. Uh, that's just one of the data components. Uh, we have uh, the skipjack assessment is much more driven by the tagging data than the CPU. So the, yeah, the fit to the CPU is not uh, a core focus, perhaps. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess what I'd like to draw the conversion conversation. Uh, Towards it is a little bit uh, the the difference between handcasting and uh, retrospective analysis because we deeply care about uh, the management quantities, relative stock size, and fishing mortality, and uh, sort of consist how consistent slash reliable the models are uh, in in terms of uh, estimating those management quantities. Uh, I guess I understand some of the reasons people might prefer handcasting for survey indices, for example, if they're not super noisy, let's say, or super steady, like in the case with CPU. Um, and the fact that you're predicting something that's observable and, and so forth, there are some, yeah, sort of theoretical, I guess, uh, preferences or sort of benefits of, of handcasting. But I think for what we do, uh, retrospective analysis, it's not going to be our only basis for sort of gauging the, the quality uh, or weight of each model, but certainly a big one. Thanks, Ani. Um, any other comments or questions? Yeah, Tashi. Toshi. So regarding the hind casting, um, so I think we need, so someone mentioned, uh, previous speaker mentioned that uh, we need some simulation stuff uh, to evaluate the performance of the hind casting itself. And so the a question raised of Mark is very much important. What kind of the indices or what kind of quantity to be uh, used for the uh, overall evaluation of the performance of the hind casting? So the initial idea to use the hind casting is because stock assessment model without having a good prediction may not contribute to the good uh, management. So uh, I think the when we evaluate the performance of hind casting, it's good to have a uh, having performance measure regarding the stock assessment, but also the we may have some uh, performance measure regarding success probability of the management. So th that may be uh, included in a uh, uh, additional uh, uh, performance measure for hind casting uh, if we can elaborate more. And also uh, regarding the uh, contrast. Uh, uh, comparison of the, of the concept of the uh, model averaging. So Bayesian method uh, 
can address with, uh, as Phil mentioned, that uh, Bayesian method can address with the uh, idea of hand sampling or modeling averaging. And uh, if we have a uh, one right model among the 10 candidate models, one is right and nine is not right, then a uh, Bayesian method can uh, guarantee that if the data is infinitely available, and if the uh, right model is included in the candidate models, posterior probability of the model given data may converge to one, and the other probability of the model given the data may go to uh, zero. So the uh, such kind of the uh, performance uh, uh, characteristics of the Bayesian probability uh, modeling or averaging may have good uh, philosophy and also good mechanism. And we may be also evaluate the if the hind casting or the kind of the prediction uh, scale have a such kind of the nice uh, asymptotic or some convergence probability uh, to narrow down the weight to some model might be good. So person failure may have a good, but that, that to have some confidence of the models or confidence set of the models, but a uh, person failure may not contribute to the uh, reducing or giving a higher probability to some model or some good model. Uh, so um, I think the way to, we may have a way to uh, like a numeric uh, quantitative uh, evaluation of the model through the some likelihood or even the high casting some other measure might be useful uh, our direction for the uh, assessment and management. Thank you. Okay, thanks Toshi. And on that, I think we should end the session and, and go to lunch. Um, we've, slight, we've had a slight difference lunch today, so we're coming back at um, quarter to two, so 1.45, and we're gonna get a, a keynote from Ray Hilborn to uh, close the, the session, uh, the, the sort of the um, presentations. Um, and after that, we're going to have uh, quite a long um, uh, discussion period to where we can bring up any points um, that were raised um, or any topics that we covered um, during the whole um, uh, workshop. So um, we'll see you all back here at, at uh, quarter to two. <laughs>